their review in today's public hearings. Members of the public at this time, please take a moment to turn off your or otherwise silence your cell phones and devices so that the board can hear the cases without interruption. For these public hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearings. In today's hearing, staff will present site plans, map, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will pre make his or her presentation to the board. After the appellant's presentation, the board will hear those wishing to speak in support of the appeal. If the appeal has any opposition, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition presents its testimony, the appellant will have a time for rebuttal. According to the BZA rules, the appellant has five minutes for his or her presentation if there is no opposition present. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow 10 minutes for each side to present testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, the appellant should reserve some portion of the allotted 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on the case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, Section 174180. All section numbers that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1, 1998. I will introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it a part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for the ne Metro Nashville Network, it is imperative that anyone addressing the board come forward, sit at the tables, and identify yourself by name and address before making your desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board to establish a quorum. The Code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present, but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days will be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to Chancery or Circuit Court within 60 days of the entry of an order. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing by the BZA within 60 days of the public hearing. After that time elapses, the board decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you're required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, the board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified via certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. I do have some preliminary announcements regarding cases that have been deferred or withdrawn. First, case 2019-098 involving property at 915 B Ramsey Street has been deferred to May 2nd. Case 2019-155 at 52 Industry Street has been deferred to May 16th. Case 2019-158 involving property at 1700, 1618, and 1616 19th Avenue South has been withdrawn. And on the short terminal docket, case 2019-101 has been withdrawn. I guess we need to wait for Ms. Karpanek to get back before we move on to the consent agenda. So as soon as Ms. Karpanek uh, returns, we'll go through our consent agenda. I will make the announcement first. Um, for members of the public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at each of its meetings. There she is. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the requested action by the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, the case is then recommended to the board for approval. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here, is here in opposition to one of the cases identified for the consent agenda, please raise your hand, make sure I see you. We'll pull it off of the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. Mr. Chairman, these are the cases that have been recommended for the consent agenda. Case 2019-119, involving property at 1724 24th Avenue North. This is a sidewalk variance request. Note that the appellant has agreed to planning's recommendation. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 119? 
Seeing none, the next case recommended for the consent agenda is 2019-154, involving property at 5403 Centennial Boulevard, also a sidewalk variance request. Also, they have agreed to planning's recommendation. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 154? Seeing none, 2019-157, involving property at 1313A Woodland Street. This is a sidewalk variance request. The appellant has agreed to planning's recommendations. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 157? Seeing none, the next case is 2019-163, involving property at 1221 Old Hickory Boulevard. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 163? Next case, 2019-164, property at 300 Great Circle Road. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 164? Finally, case 2019-167, involving property at 616 and 618 Crowley Drive. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 167? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, to review, the uh, cases on consent agenda are as follows. Case 2019-119, 2019-154, 2019-157, 2019-163, 2019-164, and 2019-167. We would solicit a vote from the board at this time. Okay, there's a motion for these uh, to be on the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor of the consent agenda say aye. aye. Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. All right, members of the public, if your case was just approved on consent, you're free to go. Please give our staff until Monday to process all the necessary documentation associated with your appeal. At that point, you can come into our office to obtain your permit. Mr. Chairman, before we move on to cases to be heard, we would like to take the opportunity to re recognize any elected officials who are in attendance. I've seen Councilman Syracuse. Councilman Syracuse, would you like to address the board or wait? Councilman jo uh, Council Lady Johnson, would you like to address the board? Good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for the uh, courtesy to allow me to speak at, uh, in the beginning. I am speaking in the case, I believe it's 134, uh, 5105. Uh, Harding Pike uh, sidewalk variance request. And originally, uh, applicant was requested not build at all, but we are getting close. And I believe uh, you have received recommendation from Metro planning staff. However, a planning staff sent a recommendation before I and the staff's uh, final recommendation come to conclusion. So that recommendation, we still have a little open issue. So if you have uh, the staff recommendation, uh, there's three section of the uh, concern I have. So this is the area I have. Uh, number one, section one is uh, south side of about 10 feet of uh, sidewalks. I believe staff recommendation is to install the sidewalks. Uh, maybe the paper says six foot, but it, it's a seven foot sidewalk inside of existing, uh, what does it say, stormwater drain. However, uh, I visited the site and in that stormwater drain, uh, or grade you see in this picture, it is completely clogged up and non-functioning. And this, a stormwater drain, PVC pipe, it's same way, completely clogged up and non-functioning. So as a result, you see from this picture, the water is not going into the stormwater drain as it should. So to me, it does not make any sense to have concrete over non-functioning a stormwater drain. So my proposal to the applicant is, I'm gonna bring Metro stormwater uh, engineer and walk with if it's indeed a Metro stormwater's easement, so they might be able to assist us to uh, clean up the drain as well as uh, give us appropriate location for the curb gutter and new sidewalks and so forth. And if it's feasible, I would like to continue uh, same as uh, the existing, I believe which was 5115 Harding Pike. Uh, that was, uh, variance was accepted about a year or so ago. Uh, that 
section, uh, instead of regular uh, six-foot grass strip and eight-foot sidewalks, we came up with three-feet grass strip and seven-feet uh, sidewalks. That is, we envisioned eventually five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, from that section of Harding all the way through Highway 70 and Highway 100, or the older building will be eventually upgraded. So when it's happened, we envisioned uniformed sidewalk in that section of the uh, Harding Pike. So therefore, uh, it makes sense to me to have a uniform design, three feet uh, grass strip with seven foot uh, concrete. So if that uh, section can uh, continue that, because that is, uh, one building is in between in under construction 5115 Harding Place and this uh, application. So that section, I would like to continue that. And then section number two, uh, the staff. Uh, Councilor, any, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but sure. it, it sounds like uh, this, um, we had originally put this on the consent agenda just because th there was an alternative plan. Right. And it sounds to me like it might be a better solution to defer this for another for one meeting uh, because it sounds like we're really close. Yes, and, it and is. I don't, yes, um, and, and I I don't want to have to remember all of the points that you're making because <laughs> I, I, I hear you and it all makes a lot of sense. And and when you said you wanted to walk the the, the property with stormwater and with the applicant, it it just spoke to me that that uh, a two week or a one meeting deferral, right. if that's enough time, would give you enough time to to perfect this plan and as uh, just as as a, a, a notice to anybody here that has a sidewalk variance if uh, if, if the applicant agrees with the planning department uh, most often that is a consent agenda item and so if you all can come up with something that you agree with planning and the applicant agrees with planning then then it would be likely to be on the consent agenda next time uh, but it sounds like a deferral would be the best Yes, on my side, I'm perfectly fine with the deferral, but I, unfortunately, I was contacted by the, uh, you know, applicant, right. like a last, uh, a few days prior to the last scheduled meeting, and it was deferred one time. So I am not sure if the applicant is ready to, you know, accept the deferral. If applicant accept the deferral, I'm perfectly fine with the right. deferral and continuously working with the applicant and then come up with uh, appropriate design so it can be consent at the next uh, hearing. Yeah, and, and I don't know if there's an applicant here. Is that a... Yes. Well, I believe... Come to the microphone if you would, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, would you come to... Yeah. There it is. Sorry, Roy Williams, applicant. Uh, I believe we can stipulate to a couple of things that, that Ms. Johnson and I just spoke about prior to the meeting, and probably uh, if you're able to uh, add those as conditions to this plan, um, I believe we can get this done today. Okay. Another deferral is really going then to how severely about, how impact about, my client. Okay, then how about if, would you all mind uh, maybe either uh, talking somewhere where you can I'm write right. out just mm -hmm. what the specific uh, conditions are, and then if if your case if we get to your case before you have done that, then we will get we will put it as immediately next when it's there, and that way we'll have something that we can say you know these are the conditions, uh, and, the, and can compare them to you know the plan that planning has. If if you don't mind that, you may already have it written no, down. No, not at all. I already uh, sent uh, a very close uh, condition okay. with uh, Mr. Lamb, so she will have, uh, she does have uh, all those conditions in writing, so just uh, we'll make it sure we and uh, applicant is the same page and then resubmit to you. Right, because I know it's evolved, it's evolved from, you know, planning, wanting disapproval, then we have an alternative, and now you all want to tweak the alternative, which is fine. That is correct, but yes. That, uh, but let's, it, yeah, we just want to make sure when we pass something that it's, it's what everybody's agreed to do, and, and uh, we just have to do that once. But if you don't mind doing that, then, then I think we can just, we can hear it, and then everybody will be happy, right? Sure. Awesome. <laughs> Let us work on it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. You want to go? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Good to see everybody. Um, I am here to speak on behalf of the applicant in uh, case 2019-152, your sole uh, short-term rental case. Um, the applicant, Julie Bueller, owns um, multiple small businesses in Donaldson, um, Fat Bites, Ellendales, if you, you may have been there. Um, she, in 2018, went through a fundamental change in that Ellendales closed down, and she has worked uh, extraordinarily hard over time uh, to ensure the success of the other business so I think this is really a just an honest mistake that she let the, the permit lapse on, on this short-term rental. Uh, when she comes up here and you review the case, I believe you'll find, unless uh, today there was emails or whatnot, that no, none of the neighbors have spoken uh, against uh, her uh, getting this renewal. Um, she interviews all, all of her uh, tenants, and uh, she runs a, a, a very good short-term rental. So and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm here in support of her to, to get this renewal. So I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. I don't believe there are any other council members here, so absent any other announcements, Mr. Chairman, we're ready to begin with the docket. The first case for the board to consider today is case 2019-097, involving property at 3601 Nolensville Pike. Is the appellant here for this case? Yes, you can come forward to the table, please. Before you, this is a uh, variance from size and material requirements on fence for automobile sales in the CS district. Councilman Freeman, I apologize, I didn't see you back there in the back. Um, CS zoning on this particular property, the board will see before you now. Area photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This is the site plan showing you the sidewalk and where the current fence exists. And these are the photographs showing you the current conditions of the property. Councilman Freeman is here, I believe, in opposition to this case, so he'll have an opportunity to speak, and then the appellant will have an opportunity. All right, Councilman Freeman. All right, thank you, board members. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, we spoke a little bit about this uh, at last meeting. I know this was deferred, and I know you guys have talked quite a bit about it. But I just wanted to uh, come and express, you know, my opposition to these this variance. Um, the regulations are in place for a reason. In this case, uh, these regulations were enacted in 2011, as we're all aware. And from my understanding, it was to prevent these uses from parking on the sidewalk and to push the inventory out of the right of way and also to establish some design standard for these uses. Um, in the past um, and currently, anyone with a shovel and strong back can build a fence with no regards for the law. You don't need a permit for these fences, so if we had a permit process, then possibly this could have been called ahead of time and dealt with then. Um, since no permit is required, the incumbent it's incumbent that the property owner, business owner, ensure that they are in compliance. Uh, the current fence, from what I understand, does not comply with any regulation in any section of the code. And the request for variance, I would ask, what is unique to this property that would meet a hardship? And at that point, I'll just... Can I, I'll I, I, have a, I do have a question, and, and I, I appreciate um, everybody's patience with the board in terms of deferring some of these to to really understand the issue because it is uh, a new issue for us. And uh, you, when I, 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 I didn't drive down Nolensville Road uh, to see this specific property, but I did spend a fair amount of time on Google. And uh, I'd, I'd like your perspective as the representative of this area to tell me how, I know you said that there are a handful that you are bringing before the board to, to try to clean up the neighborhood and have everybody meet codes. But it struck me when I was kind of going up and down the street that there are businesses that have these fences, but there are an awful lot that don't. And, uh, you know, the, the, the issue that a lot of the businesses have, have brought is safety, but it, it seems like there are a number of businesses in your district that don't have fences and, you know, may or may not have safety issues, but they haven't felt compelled to put up a fence just for that that one reason and can you give, a, give us a sense of what the extent is of, of this issue and uh, and maybe even your thoughts on the, the safety concern because it, 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 it felt like when I was going up and down the street that maybe this is uh, is not as uh, compelling as it was the first time I heard it from the applicants because of the, the 
predominant uh, businesses that don't have these fences. Uh, that's what I was going to get to a little later because directly left of this property, th this this property is sandwiched between uh, two car lots, one on either side. Um, there's one on the, the north end of Valeria, then there's one, I guess that the Durrani Auto. Um, the north the north side property they were they were before the 2011 uh, ordinance understood this property they built their fence sometime after that and the durrani auto they don't have a fence so i would contend if it's you know if it's a safety issue why do these other uses along the corridor why are they not erecting you know these same compound fences and so that would be my argument against the safety issue um and then also i would say if, if it is a safety issue then why, why don't we build the fence you know, as close to um, complying with the code as we can, maybe towards the, sorry, towards the rear of the property and secure, you know, our valuable inventory behind that fence. And okay. any other questions? Did you have anything else to add at this point? Probably, we'll, we'll just see how it goes. Hear from that, and if you would uh, state your name and tell us uh, again why you're here. I know we've heard from you before, but tell us, uh, tell us again. Yeah, the reason I was here last time it was because of the safety. What he mentioned, he told me why Durrani didn't put the fence. Have you ever spoke to Mr. Durrani? Every week he has a problem with breaking. And I was just talking to him last week, and he's frustrated and tired of this situation. You know, no businessman likes to put the fence around his inventory and drop his sales about 50%. <clears throat> why, why should I do that? Because I was tired of vandalism. I was tired of damaging to my car. I was tired of breaking in my cars. And I spent a lot of money every week. That's why I put a nice fence over there to protect my inventory, to protect my capital. I cannot spend every week money to repairing these cars. And you guys talking about a fence three feet high? I'm not a fast food restaurant. I'm a car lot dealer. My fence cannot be three feet high. An eight years kid can jump over that fence. That's not a fence for a car lot. So the code has to, you know, revaluation for about the new plan for car lots. 85% to 90% of businesses in Northern Road are the car dealers. And uh, I don't know, I spent a lot of money. Now I have to tear everything down with no fence. This is secures my building, secures my inventory. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> any other, any questions for the applicant? Did you have anything else to? I, I would still contend that safety is not a hardship um, because it's not unique to this property. Um, and you know, if, if we can enforce the code, that'd be great. But you know, I'm, well, I'm you know, I, I do have some bend and some flexibility there, possibly. But you know, I, I just don't see that this meets the hardship. Well, let me ask. Uh, let me add another thing. Have you, Mr. Chairman? Of course, we'll want to direct all commentary to the board, not to the other witnesses. Thank you. Uh, have you ever noticed the next car lot next to me? Yes. Sir. Yeah. You, you. You can. If you have a point, you can make it to the board, and then if we can ask the councilman. Okay. Sir, if you could turn your microphone back on, please. Thank you. My fence is very nice, uh, plastic coated, galvanized, and I try to, you know, take it clean and as the best as possible to be ordered to protect my stuff. Uh, he may say it is not a safety issue. It is a safety issue because I'm dealing with it. Mr. Durrani is dealing with it. 
but he didn't put the fence up, and he's still complaining. If you go over there, you see every day they have, you know, they broken in his lot, and the other day he was telling me, I'm tired of this situation. And unfortunately, Metro Police doesn't do anything about this stuff. They just come over there, write a report, and that's it. Processing, and I want to make sure everybody has a chance to develop a question if they want a question. You, you have nothing now to add? Everybody's good? I, I, mean, I still could stand, contend that, you know, safety is not a hardship. You and that's, that's the variance that we're, we're requesting, right? And the, the one thing that I did hear you say, you said that you uh, might have some flexibility and, you know, again, not uh, th this is a really difficult case. I think it, it, it is for me personally. I can only speak for myself until we get to uh, to deliberations. But it's a very difficult uh, situation. And so when I heard you say uh, you might have some flexibility that uh, says, is there any any merit in, you know, continuing this longer and talking it through and, and trying to work something out? Uh, because, like I said, and, and it's not just this one case, it's it's the anticipation of a handful of other non-compliant cases that, that we know are in the in the pipeline, and so I, that that's the question. Um, if there is some flexibility, is it worth a discussion further with uh, the applicant to understand what um, might be acceptable in terms of? Uh, maybe compliant materials, but a taller fence or some other alternative that is not, uh, you know, purely code compliant. So, I mean, is it is it worth that extra effort, or is it, <laughs> or, 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 or do you, is it worth? Uh, well, I'm, I'm seeing you know, where I really, we are now. Um, I, I mean, if, if it, at the end of, at the end of the day, um, I'm, I'm more interested to hear what you guys have to say. And just see where that comes. And um, you know, if we can, if we can find something that works, then possibly. But we'll just, you know, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board? All right, sir. Did you have anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you. Okay. Well, at this point, then we will close the hearing, public hearing, and see uh, where we are. Have discussion. Well, I mean, I, this is really tough for the applicant because uh, I understand uh, his his predicament is not a good one to be in. Without the fence, I think he's exposed to his business being hurt uh, substantially. And um, in, the, in the ideal world, you wouldn't have to have a fence because, <laughs> you know, the, there would be enough security provided by the city that that there wouldn't be issues. Um, but, and the reason I think it's really tough is uh, the applicant has such an equitable position, but our job is to apply the code and, and uh, determine whether there is a variance. And the, this issue is, as is, is we pointed out last time, it is not unique to the property. Um, and I'm, I'm, would like to help the applicant, but I'm struggling to find a way to do it within the authority that we have. And if somebody has a another angle on that, I'm certainly open to hearing it. Well, that, that, that's, that's, that's where I was trying to figure out too, because it, uh, this isn't the first applicant to raise the issue for the reason for the fence. And I understand that, but I also understand that, 
you know, it clearly isn't a, a code compliant material or a code compliant height. And that's where I was hoping that there would be a mechanism uh, besides the four of us to figure out what that answer is um, and, and, uh, and, and leave with something that is uh, maybe a little more palatable to everybody, but that may not be what uh, the situation we're in, so. Okay, I will go out there and say, I think there is the hardship of the property that need, the inventory needs to be developed, unless there was a reason that the cars were not allowed to be in the right of way. But I'm not, I don't think I understand the code that he's prohibited from putting those cars there. I think the concept is you can't park on my sidewalk. You can't park on the sidewalk, but he's allowed, I'm looking at this picture, he's allowed to park cars there. In the spot where he's parked, he's allowed to park. The fence is the sole issue under 17-16-070. So he's allowed to park cars there, and he should be able to protect his inventory in some manner. It doesn't seem that a three-foot high fence is is enough protection. And it's painful for me to say this because I would prefer not to see a chain link fence here. Um, so I think to protect his inventory, I think we could allow a higher fence, but it would need to be a different material that is code compliant. And I think we've been given those requirements here. So I think I would be willing to support a variance in the height, but require that the um, fence material be co-compliant. Well, and, and that's that's a little bit of the dilemma that I feel like we're in, and that, you know, this is, I think, a six-foot fence. We had somebody else with, has an eight-foot fence and testified, and again, it's not this hearing, but but uh, it, it addresses uh, an issue that I think goes into uh, us trying to come up with a, a potential solution, and that is, well, what's an appropriate height? I mean, is is you know, that, that testimony was, well, eight feet is necessary to keep people out. They could get over six feet. And so I think that, that goes to that problem of us trying to solve something that uh, I don't feel like I, I mean, you're, you're a professional. You know how to solve this a lot better than I do, and I, try, and I respect that. But I, I don't feel like I have that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, that's where I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable. I think oh, do you have I think his testimony is that this height of a fence protects the inventory, right. um, and I guess it's six feet high. Is that what you? So what was? What's the height? Can we ask? Six him feet. Yes, yeah, six feet. I I guess like I'm super sympathetic to the applicant, but I keep going back to the earlier comment by Commissioner Pepper where. It, this hardship is not unique to the property. It's unique to the use of how the property is. And the code doesn't really anticipate that. So I guess this is why this one's sort of hard because we have what the code says and then we have the applicant who's facing issues from a safety perspective. And I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is like, if the fence was in the back and, the, and I don't know if that's workable for the way that this is set up because I don't have another picture, but is it at all workable for the cars and the inventory to be in the back and then there's a fence or anything like that? Because I am I am concerned about the precedent it would set. Because every, every applicant, every variance would be di like different. Like everybody has, I know that safety is the issue, but that code doesn't anticipate that that being a hardship unique to the property. So that's kind of where I am. I think we can look at, um, and I'm just reading from our, um, our uh, board rules or I Can you tell me where you are on that? What? Yeah, I'm reading standards for a variance. Uh, it's maybe not in our board rules, but it's published on the, it's in the code. It's a yes. Yeah, it's in the 17. Code. It's 174370. 70 what? 174370. 174370. That's right. And I'm looking at the part and codes department can can speak on this too, but the and we've contemplated in the past um, extraordinary and exceptional conditions of such property would result in pe peculiar and exceptional practical difficulties to exceptional or undue hardship upon the owner of such property. So we are allowed to 
to um, consider things that are extraordinary circumstances. Can I, can I see that? I think my copy doesn't. For some reason, it's short. Okay. Or I can't get Twans and be fine. Thanks. I have a copy, but I don't think it has the last part. And Mr. Pepper, I think she's reading from the state law, not from our Metro Code. The state law allows that other extraordinary circumstances that's, that's also unique to the property. Are you, were you reading from the state law or were you reading from the zoning code? So I thought you were reading. It's standards for a variance and it's on our website and I just have a copy I of it. I think that's the Metro. I think that's, that's the physical characteristic. Exceptional condition of such property would result in peculiar and exceptional practical difficulties. Is that what? And Mr. Pepper, I think the reference here is to the Tennessee Code Annotated 13-7, and I believe it's 207. Forgive me for not remembering the exact right citation there, but it's in 13-7, which is a section of state law that deals with planning and zoning in particular, and talks about what, and I won't quote it correctly, but talks about that other extraordinary circumstance um, concept, which becomes a basis by which but is it the board other can contemplate a variance? Beg your pardon? Is it extraordinary circumstances unique to the property, or is it just extraordinary Mr. circumstances, uh, period? I'll defer to Metro Legal on this, as Mr. Poole has just pulled a quick copy of it, which I appreciate. It's 137207. Uh, or other extraordinary and exceptional situation or condition of such piece of property, the strict application of any regulation enacted under this part results in a particular, a peculiar rather, and exceptional practical difficulties to or exception or undue hardship upon the owner of such property. Um, written with crystal clarity that we've come to expect from our friends at the state legislature, of course. But, okay, but I think it says exceptional, D doesn't it say We'll pass that down. Okay. Well, it, it, it seems to me, I mean, I, again, we've all been thinking about it, and it's a, it's, I think it's, it's a very difficult case, and it's a case that I think that uh, none of us would like to have to decide. Um, and that's why they pay us to decide these, right? Uh, we're, we're an all-volunteer board. We don't get paid just to make sure everybody in the audience is clear on that. Um, but the, uh, it, it seems to me that the burden uh, on an alternative is, is is the applicants because the, the fence isn't compliant. And, you know, the, the, the thought I'm thinking now is what's, you know, is, is there something that, uh, is, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll look toward the, our legal team to make sure that what I'm brainstorming is, is uh, doable, but it, it seems like there may be an alternative to, to provide a, a very short-term variance, maybe a month, uh, two months, uh, to give the applicant uh, time to provide an alternative plan that uh, may or may not be acceptable, uh, but wouldn't require them to, to remove the fence immediately, uh, and, and that it would be up to the applicant to come up with a plan that uh, presumably uh, the council and the neighbors would uh, appreciate. And if that's the case, I think that there would be willingness to consider it. Uh, and if not, then at the end of that short period of time, uh, the applicant would not be code compliant and would be required to uh, correct that issue. Mm -hmm. Is that something that is something we can do or is that? I apologize. I was speaking to the zoning administrator and didn't hear the proposal. Uh, Mr. Poole, did you, did you have a thought on that or? I don't think the, think that the rules would prohibit a short term variant. Um, I believe this is is this, this is the first public hearing, so I believe there is some time. Second public hearing. But yes. No, this is the no second public, public hearing, we but deferred, it was deferred at the first one. Um, so that, that's one avenue that you could pursue granting a, a short-term variance. Um, but I, I do think that you guys have the, the right idea as to not try to craft the application for the applicant. They have presented a certain terms to you requesting a variance. Right. 
you, you can make a decision on that, or you can have the applicant come back with an alternative and see if that's something that uh, he could get four votes on. Well, and 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 I guess that you know, I'd, I'd, as a former math major who doesn't do math very as well as I used to, I'd, I'd, I'm kind of wired to try to solve problems, and and I think a lot of uh, architect and attorneys are too, and. So I think sometimes we get caught up in trying to, to find an answer. And uh, that's, it, it, it was, I reminded myself that I think it is at this point, because it is a non-code compliant fence, it really is the applicant's uh, responsibility to come up with that answer. Yet I think that there's uh, broad consensus that they're empathetic with the issues that the applicant has raised. And that's where I, I feel like maybe there's an alternative to uh, maybe a, something short-term to allow the applicant to, to try and figure something that uh, the councilman and, and we would agree to. Doesn't, doesn't, if, if we deny the application, though, he, he has the right to, re to come back for another uh, request, another variance. I mean, isn't that what you're, we're essentially doing if we deny? He can reapply with a new request for a new variance, correct? It would have to be a substantial, a substantively different request. Right. He can't make the same request within right. six months. I understand months. that, but there's no time. He could do that within As long as it's month. different, yes. As long as it's substantially different. Okay. That's right. And the, and the only difference between just a flat out denial and uh, formally allowing some time is that uh, it would uh, basically say, yeah, you, you can keep doing what you're doing. I mean, if we deny it, then presumably he's got to take that down ASAP and then provide an alternative plan through that process. But, and again, I, that may be the way to go. I'm just was trying to. Yeah. I misunderstood. I thought you were proposing that it would have, the fence would have to come down immediately. But no, no, I was saying okay. give it, I was, I was proposing, I was throwing out as a thought, uh, again, not, not as, as a motion or proposal because I just wanted to, to flesh it out a little bit. Uh, if we allowed a very short term, say two month variance, uh, at which time, during which time, presumably the applicant would uh, work toward an alternative plan, uh, hopefully closely with this council person, so that when uh, the alternative plan was presented to us, that it would be uh, something that we would be pretty strongly likely to consider. But, you know, and again, that uh, saying that because uh, the only reason I'm saying that is because I'm empathetic with the issues that the applicant stated and yet fully aware that, um, that the, the code is not in his favor. I think, you know, so as you stated so nicely when we first started talking about it. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, I mean, if, if that's the board's uh, desire, I would just ask that we maybe just do it one month. That way we can track with the other case that's coming on the 16th. Okay. All right. Um, then I will, uh, I will make a motion that we uh, approve a one month variance for this fence. Uh, with the uh, intent of allowing the applicant time to uh, develop an alternative plan and um, and I guess that's, that's well, the, this, this forces an alternative plan rather than a deferral um, that, that allows the applicant to come up with an alternative plan uh, that presumably is, is more code compliant, but yet uh, allows him to address some of the safety issues that he has talked about, and uh, hopefully with the uh, working with this council member. Mr. Chairman, is your intent for the case to come back on May 16th? I would, I would, say yes. Is that, so is that would certainly. I just would was clarifying. I would think that the, the applicant would have an, an opportunity to come back on May 16th with a proposal. So that'll be included in your motion? Yes. Okay. Uh, if, if, if agreeing to that just included it, then yes. That, that's the motion, and y'all may or may not agree. If there's not a second, then we'll have another motion. I have a second. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? 
So I, I can support that because it's one month, but I, I think we've been to some extent, this, these are, this is a really tough case. Uh, he's in a really, uh, he's between a rock and a hard place with what's happening with his potentially with his inventory and the code. But I would just, uh, caution the applicant that, uh, I would also have a backup plan in case we don't approve uh, some kind of alternative design uh, because he's got inventory out there and he's trying to run a business. And I don't, I, my struggle with this has been, I don't know that there's a lot of middle ground here. Uh, I hope there is. I hope that, that, that it can be found, but I'm not, I'm just not, I don't think it's going to be tough. Well, and, and I, I hope that the, the signal that at least through the motion is uh, doing everything possible to err on the side of uh, the applicant's uh, needs, knowing that there is um, there's not a clear way to provide relief for the applicant because of the hardship issues that you discussed in terms of uh, lack of specificity uh, on this piece of property, um, and, and so I hope that uh, I hope that that's heard. Any other, any other comments? Thank you, thank you. Uh, other than I agree with Commissioner Pepper's comments, it's sort of, I'm very empathetic to the applicant, but I feel like it's one of those cases where the law is pretty clear and without some really compelling evidence that shows how this is a hardship, it's sort of hard to, it's sort of hard for me to be inclined to grant the Variance. But I think your plan of giving him a month is good, and I would support your motion. Okay. All right. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe I saw Ms. Sanford get here, which will allow us. To, there's another case that has been recommended for the consent. The um, It's a sidewalk variance request, case 2019-165. Um, I would note the applicant is here, has agreed to the planning recommendation. Councilman Davis, would you like to speak on this? Councilman Davis, would you like to speak on this? And I would also note for the record that um, Ms. Davis has recused herself in this case. Thank you, everybody. Mike. Okay. To be clear, are we on 165? Yeah, okay. is a potential consent. That's right, 165. Okay. This would is proposed for the consent agenda. All right. Okay. Hi, right. commissioners. Everybody, thank you for volunteering your time. Thank you, codes and metro staff members for working your long hours. Um, I am going to be a little bit different here. Um, I'm going to go against the recommendations of the of planning and possibly recommendations of the applicant, um, just to be fair, because there's already a sidewalk there, and I'm asking for the waiver, the waiver of the sidewalks, A, because they're already there, also a waiver of the um, in lieu fee, because um, A, there's already a sidewalk there that's pretty new, and I'm very consistent in how I feel, and if you vote a different way, I'm not mad at you. All right, we still love each other. And so please, please waive the sidewalk and the Luffy. I'm Councilman Davis, and thank everybody for being here. God bless you all. Great, thank you. And for the board um, members that are here, there was an updated recommendation from planning with an alternative design, and that's what the um, appellant has agreed to. Yes, along with planning's recommendation. And so that, I mean, and, and the, the reason it goes to consent is that the planning department, and according to our board guidelines that the, the board has voted on, is that um, the planning staff makes a recommendation if the applicant agrees and has, as you said, requested that we approve that, um, then we can vote on putting that on consent. And I think that was a request of the applicant too, right? So. Um, I don't have an issue with the planning. I mean, I, I appreciate the council member's uh, uh, perspective, but I, I, I think if somebody's willing to upgrade their sidewalks to the new standard and everybody agrees, I think that's a wonderful thing. And so I'm, I'm happy to move that that goes back on the consent agenda. I would second that. 
I may have a motion in a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Well, I want to understand what they're, so they're building a new sidewalk. On yeah, they're going to put a, a brand new sidewalk on Douglas. They're going to keep the existing sidewalk on Joseph. Okay, because it wasn't necessarily stated. Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. yeah, just. Maybe I'm on the wrong one. Yeah, that's the, that's the new recommendation. Okay. Let me take it a second if you need. No, it's fine. Okay, so we have a motion, we have a second. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. It's back on consent. Um, next case is case 2019-134. This was the one that was previously recommended for consent. Council Lady Johnson had expressed some concern. I believe they have met and come up with an agreement, so I'll let Council Lady Johnson address the board, and then if the board okay. sees fit, it, could, it too could go back on the consent agenda. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we had lively discussion and came up with the agreement. I will let uh, applicant speak so we can be on the same page. Thank you so much for giving us the time to get that worked out. I, I do appreciate it. Um, we would ask you to approve our um, application with the two additional conditions, uh, being that the uh, clogged storm drain structure at the south corner of the site be cleaned out uh, so that it is properly functioning uh, and we will coordinate with uh, stormwater and Metro Public Works regarding the position of the sidewalk there. Um, once we determine that that storm drain is functional, then we will have a proper positioning for the sidewalk. Second condition would be that the five foot sidewalk on leak, which was shown to stop at the rear curb cut, that sidewalk would continue to the eastern property line. Yes, with that uh, two conditions, uh, we are on the same page, and I will reluctantly let go the relocation of the sign, although it's uh, odd, but I think, you know, we will have to kind of carve around that area, and it would be better for the community than no sidewalks, so I will reluctantly uh, drop that condition, and we are on the same page. Okay, I'll, uh, thank you, and thank you for uh, meeting and, and working that out. Um, I'll move the, the uh, that this case go back on the consent agenda with the two conditions that the applicant just read. Did you get those? Um, and that uh, the, the two conditions that were adjusting uh, the proposed site plan that planning had uh, provided. We have a motion, we have a second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank, Thank you so and good luck. Thanks for your time and consideration. I appreciate it. Next case is case 2019-131 involving property at 1525 Preston Drive. Zoning map here shows you the zoning of the property as R10. The proposal for to construct two single family houses without building sidewalks or paying into the sidewalk fund is the applicant here for this case. Case 2019-131. Jacob Bender. Okay, I'll, I'll move that we defer this case uh, one meeting uh, unless the, is there any opposition to this case? Since there's no opposition, I'll, we will move to defer this one meeting unless the applicant has just stepped out for uh, some reason and, and comes back in the next uh, few minutes. Otherwise, it'll, uh, we'll uh, defer that one meeting. Sorry. All in favor, say aye. Next case, 2019-136, is Mark Finn here. Are y'all here for this case? Okay, please come forward to the table. This is a case involving property at 3505 Elkins Avenue, requesting a variance from sidewalk requirements to construct a single family home without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Before you is a zoning map showing you the zoning of the property is RS5. Aerial photography showing you the property in the surrounding area. This is the proposed site plan for the property. And finally, photographs showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 136? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make your desired presentation. Please identify yourself by name and address before addressing the board. Do you want to talk to this? <laughs> uh, hello. Um, so we are building a house at this uh, location. What's that? 
my name is Elizabeth Beard, and I am uh, building this property <laughs> with Stephen Jones here. And um, the sidewalk, as you can see in the pictures, and I have additional pictures here if you guys would like to look at them, um, is in excellent condition for the entire street. And um, if, we, if the sidewalk is moved in the four feet that is being recommended, as you look down the street, you can see the poles that the sidewalk would end up going through. Um, and, and there are also retaining walls and other properties as well that uh, the sidewalk would end up going through. So as you can see, the sidewalk is in perfect condition through the entire length of the street. So if we were to move the sidewalk in for just our property location, if you were walking down the sidewalk, you would have to jump over four feet just for our house and then jump back um, to continue walking along. So why would, you not, why would you not agree to pay into the fund I mean, that, that the planning department has said that that basically is okay. Why is it not okay to pay into the fund? Well, um, one of the reasons being, if you can see on the pictures, the sidewalk is in excellent condition. And we also even, um, there was a portion of our sidewalk that we even replaced as well once um, we put in gas line there and things along those lines. So I don't know if you guys have anything to add. So, right. I, I mean, I understand that, but we, and you're not the first person to make that argument, but you know, the, the city council, when they passed this rule, um, they were kind of expecting, you know, and there are a lot of people that don't have sidewalks and really don't have the ability in terms of the engineering of their property um, at, the, at the street to be able to put in sidewalks and they pay into the fine so that the city can pay for sidewalks as they did yours. So again, is there a, a reason other than the existing nice sidewalk for not paying into the fine? Additional reasons. It costs us a fortune. <laughs> it, it's it's highly cost prohibitive for us to take on that responsibility when there's a perfectly good sidewalk in front of this property already. It's that that's a that's a pretty large cost for us to have to bear. Yeah, and, and you said you have a 50 foot lot. Is that what's the, the size of your lot? Size. Yes. Okay. Is there? Um, Is there anything else to, that you have to add or? That? No. Any questions for the applicant? All right. Yes, sir. I think they would be willing to dedicate the land as a right of way for future sidewalks if, if, if you needed. Please identify yourself by name and address. Tracy Grooms, uh, 718 Dunlap Street, Paris, Tennessee. I'm the builder. Is there, is there a physical hardship for moving the sidewalk or making the, that sidewalk compliant? Besides, I mean, you mentioned poles in the, in the, along the street, but is there a pole in this specific property? There, there is. is that, I mean, is that the one that, I mean, I see, a, I see a, like a plumbing clean out and then I see a pole, but it doesn't look like. The water, water meter is also right in that area as well. Right. All the utilities are in that. All the utilities are in that front right corner there. Okay. And the neighbor's driveway. Really the transition from the sidewalk that they're wanting to do, the new one, the transition down would be through her driveway and an alleyway on the other side. Anything else to add? No. All right, we will close the public hearing and discuss. I don't see the hardship that prohibits them from paying into the in lieu fund and also people build around poles all the time. It may not be pretty, but it works. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see the hardship either. That's Metro Council enacted that law and I know it costs people money, but. Well, and what, you know, one of the things that, you know, that's the, the not tough with the sidewalk law, but we hear a lot, you know, we have people in some neighborhoods that have big drainage ditches that, this, you know, the city's put in or whoever built the neighborhood put in, uh, you know, there, there's no curb, there's no sidewalk, there's a big giant gutter and they'll come and say, well, why should I you know, pay? I'll never have a sidewalk. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, folks like this applicant, well, why should I have to pay? I have a perfectly good sidewalk. Well, that makes sense. And, and we've heard enough of these to where I know 
there's a, a pretty decent rational argument um, for basically no one following uh, the sidewalk rule because there's usually a pretty good reason. Uh, but that's not what the council empowered us. They didn't say, well, if, if there's, I think there are some problems with the law that we hear um, because every lot's not exactly the same, but, but this particular lot is not unique to those that we've heard. I guess I was persuaded by your argument, Mr. Chairman, that the city did spend money to build that sidewalk that is there. And there are areas that don't have sidewalks, and I didn't understand, I don't think the applicant understood what you were saying, that they have the advantage of that sidewalk that is there, but others don't have that advantage. And I see people walking up in the street every day in my community that desperately need sidewalks. And so I would have a hard time voting for this variance. Motion. I will move to deny the sidewalk uh, variance request. The, um, we have a motion, we have a second. Um, Hold me, okay. The, the uh, and the only, the only comment I have is, is it, I'm not sure if it's, if we deny it, if, let's see if they are allowed to. Do you, uh, I, I, would, it, you, would you consider uh, a motion to uh, approve the variance with the conditions of the planning department, which require to pay into the fund, but would allow them to keep the existing sidewalk at their choosing? Oh, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I, I could second that. So it would be approved with the conditions to, recommended with the by the planning department. Are you okay with her, the, drawing that motion and changing? I am. Okay, there's a motion and a second to approve the variance with the uh, three conditions uh, that the planning department uh, recommended, and that has been seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor of that say aye. aye. Any opposed? That passes five to nothing. Good luck. Thank you. Next case, 2019-137, involving property at 933 Warren Street. This is a uh, request for a variance from setback requirements to construct two single family houses. Before you is a zoning map showing you the zoning of the property is RS 3.75. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area up and down the street. Proposed site plan. And finally, the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case uh, 137? Seeing none, Mr. Eubanks, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation. Please identify yourself by name and address. Yes, Anthony Eubanks, 1401 Lytton Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37216. I'm here in regards to the property that you just announced, 33, 933 Warren Street. Uh, what I was requesting is, is that on the south side of the property is a three-foot setback, and on the north side is a 20-foot setback. And I was requesting that the north side, 20 foot setback, would be reduced to 10 foot. And the last time y'all referred it, I mean, deferred it to this particular date, the 18th, for me to go out and do some uh, setback uh, averages. And I went out and did so. I don't know if you got a copy of what I made, or I have some right here, if you'd like to pass one around. Let's see here. I don't, I don't see any in our packet, but you're welcome to pass that around. And one of the things, yeah, Mr. Eubanks, one of the things that I think we didn't have uh, at the time is the information that you're passing out, but also the overview that of the street. Right. And it's Jackson Street that you would like the 10-foot variance. And, yes, sir. And I think that uh, for me personally, I wanted to see a, a better context, and, and I, I definitely see in my what I see is that the 10 feet is, uh, would be appropriate. I mean, it, it seems in line with what is going yes, on on Jackson Street. Yes, sir. If I would say so, uh, out of all the, we took it from one end all the way to the other end. Uh, we went as far as we could. And the, uh, av and the, and the average setback was 6.76 uh, foot. Uh, some of them is right on the sidewalk. Even across the street from there, it is, it's pretty close as well. 
And matter of fact, the building that we just uh, demolished, it was uh, four foot off the off that. Uh, that was off the that commercial setback. building that yes, you come and talked to us about before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any questions for Mr. Eubanks? Did you have anything else? That Hang on one second. Let's right. take one second. Yes, sir. Any other questions for Mr. Eubanks? Did you have anything else to add? No, sir. Fine. Okay, we will close the public hearing. Uh, I mean, we, we've heard this before, and, and I think that to me the, the question was context because we just had an aerial view that uh, just had the adjacent property, which we could see uh, had uh, uh, building a home very close to Jackson Street, but we really didn't know what the rest of the street looked like. Um, it, it, to me, it, it appears fairly clear that this is uh, contextually appropriate. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, unless uh, others have a, a different thought, I'm happy to make a motion that we approve the variance uh, to 10 feet on uh, Jackson Street. I could support that. So we have a motion. We have, is that a second? No. Yes. All right. <laughs> we have a motion. We have a second. Is there any discussion? So there is some discussion from me. I, yes. I, I understand that it's contextually, and, and maybe <clears throat> I'm missing something here. I understand it's contextually appropriate, but but how is how is that a hardship? Well, I think it falls into that um, all other category. Is there, where's my catch all? The other approach? extraordinary circumstances, which uh, I don't have the law in front of me, but Mr. Poole or yes. Mr. Michael might have and it to read it. The other, okay, well, that, well, the other extraordinary circumstances. And the reason that this particular property is as an other extraordinary circumstance is because it did have, unlike most of the homes that we can see, or the properties we can see in the map. This one had a commercial property on it, which Mr. Eubanks came to us to um, to say, you know, I'd, I'd like to give up the this non-conforming use and allow two houses on this property instead of uh, the existing uh, commercial property. And I think that, to me, was an extraordinary circumstance that would allow us to consider uh, how two homes would be on that property and as a result, uh, have more of a contextual uh, view of that rather than just a, a, a strict hardship. To me, the to some extent, that hardship question was was answered when we uh, viewed the first case and said, uh, going from a commercial property and one home to to only having two homes is a is a better fit for the neighborhood and it's more appropriate for that property. It created a. a exceptional situation and so that that would be my argument for uh, why this is a, a different property than the neighbors and would warrant uh, that variance and just as a reminder I remember this case um, and not to counter anything but just yeah. as something to think about I do remember the discussion that these two homes could have been built within the setbacks but because they wanted to build larger homes that's why the setbacks were that's why they're requesting the variance and so I thought it was more I thought it was maybe larger but more distance between the homes because I thought he had like 10 feet instead I mean he could have six between the homes and he had mm -hmm. and he, he had yep. more because that was more in line with the the neighborhood so well, there's there's no opposition here which is uh, yeah. important to me but I'm I'll just I don't think the 
the fact that it's contextually appropriate, I'm, I'm struggling with still how that makes a real hardship. And, uh, well, like I said, to me, if it, if, if it was if it was just contextually appropriate, I think, you know, it might be something that is a special exception or some other type of, of, of issue. Um, and, and as I said, I, I think it's only, uh, to me, I think that's where I, I weigh it only because of the situation that, uh, that in part we put the property in to say, well, yeah, you can do this. And, and uh, the commercial property, I think, you know, the, the building, it may be the one that you see there and that aerial photo uh, was actually on the street. Um, so in, in many ways, he's, you know, pulling the buildings on this property further from the street than, than he did, you know, than existed when he purchased the property. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it is a, is there a hardship such as a narrow lot or a, a lot that's different from the neighbors? No, is there a, 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 a special, unusual circumstance or, uh, that would allow it is that uh, condition of a variance that we are able to follow. Uh, if, if I think that does exist. So, and, and that doesn't mean that you have to think it does, but, it, but that's, that's why I, I do think it does. And that's why I made the motion and, 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 and Alma seconded and we can continue to discuss or see where everybody is. Any more, anybody else? To, all right, so we have a motion, we have a second. Um, will those all in favor say aye and raise your hand? We've got two, all opposed? Raise your hand, that motion uh, fails two to three. And uh, is there any other comment or discussion or another motion? Mr. Taylor, you could also leave the mo that motion because it failed to receive four affirmative votes. It would stay open to the, for the next um, board meeting for any members who aren't present today to vote. However, I believe Ms. Chapel is not gonna be here that day. She will be back the 16th, which will be within the 30 day window for a vote to be cast. Okay. So the, the case will be held open for 30 days and that will give uh, anyone time to review or uh, change their vote or uh, Ms. Chapel to, uh, to uh, review the case and participate also. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate all right. you. Appreciate all your work. You say in 30 days. I'll come back yeah, it's May 16th. Oh, May 16th. May 16th. Okay. Uh, I can leave from here for, for. I'll take them. Okay. All right. Next case is 2019-140 involving property at 2027 Hutton Drive, requesting a variance from setback and house orientation requirements in order to construct two single family homes. Before you is the zoning map showing you the zoning of the property is R6. Aerial photography showing you the property as well as the surrounding area. Proposed site plan is submitted by the applicant. And finally, the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 140? Yes, you'll, so the appellant will have 10 minutes to make your case. Please identify yourself by name and address and be sure to reserve any rebuttal time from this 10 minutes if you would like that. Good afternoon, Chair and, and members of the BZA. Um, I'm Paula Hepp with OHM Advisors. Uh, 209 10th Avenue South in Nashville. We were here a couple weeks ago um, talking about this case, and I did provide a few uh, additional documents um, to the board. Um, a site plan. I think the, the site plan that appears on the screen is the um, setback, um, setbacks along Rosemary that doesn't really indicate or show our property. Did do you all get this, your packet? Yes. Okay. And we also provided the actual building elevation uh, house plans as well. Are we finding them? Yes. Okay. The, the, the two variances being requested today, one is with uh, for the front facade oriented toward the shorter side, and the other one is the contextual setbacks um, to the platted versus the platted setbacks for the subdivision. 
I also included in the additional information in the packet these two um, documents that kind of indicate the, the platted subdivision and how the, the homes sit on the, in the area. Um, if you look uh, up Rosemary, um, the lots north of this particular lot, and I guess what I would say is that we are requesting the variance due to, due to the peculiar, unique nature of this corner lot being almost a square versus the other platted lots in the subdivision, which are basically 200 plus feet in, in depth, where this lot, this corner lot is only 115 feet in depth. Um, so the contextual setback along Rosemary puts us at 57 feet, which would basically cut our lot in half. How far, how far back is the house now? Um, the house now probably, it sits uh, kitty corner. Do you have it in here? I'll let him look to that. That doesn't show either. Um, the code that indicates the, the facade facing the shorter street, which would be Hutton, um, Rosemary is the main, more of the main road, and the developer would like the the homes to face Rosemary because the all the homes along Rosemary are oriented that way, and to, and to have a side um, side of a home on that corner facing that direction um, isn't in keeping with the the development around it. Um, they wanted to do two unique homes and not do the typical shotgun homes and the and the tall skinnies that are popping up in the neighborhood. Um, I did speak with, I didn't speak, I emailed back and forth with Councilman Sledge. Um, he did not have the ability to meet with us, but we did converse through email. Um, he had indicated that most of the opposition had to do with the opposition to tall, skinny shotgun homes in the neighborhood and not in keeping with the neighborhood. That's why we wanted to show you the, the building elevations that are being planned here that shows the uniqueness of each of the homes to the, each other so that they don't look identical, they look like twin towers on a corner lot. Um, the biggest problem that we have is the, the lot is almost square versus the, the other platted lots in the neighborhood. It's a, it says right now that, that that lot that sits, or the house that sits kitty corner on the lot is 57 feet back. Oh, I'm sorry, 51. Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely can see the logic on the, of the, the square lot on this overview, this door, I, I guess this is, I don't know if you, if the house is still there or if you've uh, demolished it, but it, you know, the, those square corner lots were kind of designed to be different and mm -hmm. go around and as a... Uh, right. Did you... The two, the two, the two homes that are being planned here, um, one was going to be facing well, they're both going to be facing Rosemary, but the driveways were going to be pushed back further away from the intersection. Um, if we had to put both of the homes on Hutton, the, the driveways would be located closer to the intersection as well. So we we're looking out for the intersection, looking out for the driveways, trying to make it a unique, because it's a unique, unique parcel, trying to make this development a unique development within the neighborhood also. Um, what what is the hardship here? The the uniqueness of the of the property itself being square versus long elongated. Um, all the other uh, lots in the neighborhood are um, 60, 70 feet by 200 plus feet. So the contextual setback um, where you take the averages mm. um, is easier to attain on an elongated lot when it gets down to this lot, which is half the, half the depth of the lots around it, 
and meeting that contextual setback, then basically what I said before, it cuts the lot in half. It takes it, um, that lot is only 115 feet deep and if you have to take 57 feet out of it, it, uh, it makes that lot very, very hard to, to develop on. I'm Scott Story. I'm also with uh, OHM Advisors, um, 209, uh, 209 10th Avenue South. Uh, the, the current residents sitting on an angle and on the, the lot, it is still on the site. Um, just by using the, the setback that, uh, that Metro is requiring, it would throw that existing house even six feet into that, that setback. It's gonna limit that space of that lot very much so that that you can't really do anything with it. So I you're mean, saying the existing house would not be allowed to be there if it were built correct. from scratch because of that correct. setback requirement? Correct. Correct. Can, um, the, the, the house that you want to uh, build facing Hutton, mm -hmm. the one the, on the corner, uh, I think it says it's 30 feet from the property line. Yes, the platted the front, setbacks. I mean, the, so the, it's, it's yes, the platted setbacks for the subdivision. And then how, how does that relate to the house next door? The house further on Hutton is about 30 feet also. So it's, porch it's to essentially in line? In line with Hutton. Okay. The, um, the corner house is planned to have like a, a wraparound porch, so it kind of would face both, corner, you know, face both corners equally, but the drive being off of Hutton. You said the current the house is currently there does not meet the setback. It it would not meet the setback requirement if based on the average of the been. other. Okay, correct. It did meet the uh, the setback based off the platted, the original platted subdivision. Did you have anything else to add at this point? Not at this time. Thank any you. Any other questions for the applicant at this point? Okay, well, we'll hear from the opposition, and then you will have four minutes and 38 seconds for rebuttal. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gail Ravy. I'm the owner of 2025 Hutton Drive, which is the house directly left of the house that they're going to build. And that's the house that we see now that has kind of the the gray and the white. Yeah, it's a kind of a. Um, just, just to the right of the red dot. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, as you can see, my house is close to the street anyway. Uh, Ten years ago, we tried to build a house, uh, build on front, and Code said they, for some reason, they built it there and they weren't supposed to because all the other houses are built behind mine, and mine was the only one that was stuck ahead. Um, so you were asking earlier about where the other house right now presently comes, it comes to the side of my house where my central heat and air unit is. So I've got that much space forward. And to be clear, I am not in opposition of them building the houses. Um, the only thing I have, and I've heard 30 feet, so it's okay, but the only, my only question and only difficulty with that is because, as you see, Rosemary circles around a Hutton. There's no sidewalks, dogs, people, carriages, babies in carriages, kids running down the street when they go on their skateboard. But on to the right or left of my house, that is a hill on that side of Hutton, so they use that to skateboard down. And I, I, my only concern is, that if whatever they build, the people on Hutton need to have a line, uh, the line side and the people on Rosemary coming with cars need to have a line side so they can see the kids. And what, and I don't know if you saw the, the site plan that they had proposed, but just- Yes, sir, I did. Yeah, but so the, the, from what I see, it, the, the house that they want to build on the corner will be pretty much in line, they said with yours, 30 feet from the yes, street. Sir. And then it'll also be 30 feet off of Rosemary which means that it'll be uh, even a little bit further uh, in the corner. Uh, does that? 
Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that concerns? was, I, I wanted to get it on record that that was my so, okay. really so concern, okay. is that line of vision and line of sight, okay. because for future, if somebody wants to build out, right. they really should need to. Right. You know, they, sh they should be stopped like code stopped us. Okay. Um, we could build on the back, but we could build on the front. Right. So I'm okay with that if, if somebody wants to build on the front, like they want to add a nectar shed or something else, that if they can't, they can't do that because it might block the line of sight. But the 30 feet, I'm okay with. Okay. So I'm never totally opposite about the whole thing, just that corner. Okay. Great. Thank you. Is there any, thank you. Any, any questions for, thank you. Thank you so much. We did, we did talk with Ms. Raby, or Rabby, I'm sorry, ma'am. And um, we looked at the corner a little bit because she had talked about the, the kids coming down in the line of sight. And if you look across the street from, from where this development is going to be, the, the current house and the existing scrub shrub in the ditch line and on the fence is, is more of an impediment to people seeing from a line of sight south than actually north. Um, and I guess that would be more of a public works issue to clean up that, that area. And the house you're proposing on the corner has a, a porch and, I mean, it's not, mm -hmm. a, a, it's not a design that, that one would anticipate someone uh, wanting to build in the no, front. absolutely uh, not. Okay. There was also, if, if I would, if I may, um, uh, Ms. Raby that was up here earlier had mentioned before about the fence between her and our lot. Uh, because of her pets in the yard, she wanted to make sure that, that the pets were were taken care of in case she had to put another fence up. The developer uh, is, uh, is is wanting to keep that fence there, uh, so there will be no issues or anything with with anything with any pets or anything getting out. There's they're trying to do is is lease as minimal uh, construction on the site as possible only within the, the footprint of the house. Okay. Any, any questions or anything else to add? Anything else that you all have to add? No, sir. All right. Well, we will close the public hearing uh, and, and discuss. You know, this, these aren't unusual um, lots in the sense that uh, are, are, uh, these aren't unusual situations in terms of our board where you have uh, these contextual setbacks uh, defined by the properties right next door, but the lot sizes are substantially different. So uh, I, I, I absolutely see, uh, to me, I see a hardship uh, on the uh, front setback issue. And I think that because of the corner lot, which makes it unique, I think that there is a case for uh, for the orientation issue also, uh, and and certainly think that that solution is is a good solution for for that corner in the neighborhood. Um, any other? But how how do you all feel? Um, I do think the the fact that it is a corner and that it is a square and it's unique to all the other properties on this street is a hardship unique to this right. particular property, and it seems like this. Um, plan is trying to accommodate the other homes on that street as well as try to, it looks like a balanced approach to a unique piece of property, so. Yeah, I agree with that too. I mean, it's, it's clearly a, a um, unique property when you look at the plat of the other properties that adjoin it. Um, Any other thoughts or emotion? Well, I agree with all of you, but I'm not comfortable with the 30-foot setback off of Rosemary. Rosemary, I think it should be more in line with the building, the home that's next to it, to the north on this diagram I'm looking at, which is about 40 feet. I think that would be more contextual with the neighborhood and would still give them enough room to build. But it, and it would put the rear setback at 20 instead of 30? And put them a lot closer to the neighbor. Okay. If, may I chair? Do, does anybody object to opening the public hearing to address that question? Okay. Yeah. Sir, um, 
the 20 foot setback then would be off uh, um, next to Ms. Raby's house. Um, and we have 29 feet. We could slide, we could slide these about nine feet without having an issue. We were trying to preserve like a rear yard um, for, you know, uh, for family time kind of thing, but we, we could push these lots about nine, or each of these homes about nine feet um, without having too much of an issue. No, I mean, we're not. No, I just was asking if there was a question, and there's not a question. Uh, it was that was clear. Thank you. We'll close the public hearing now. We'll deliberate and. Oh, I was only going to say the houses don't need to be this large. So to me, that's still not a hardship. But I understand the fact that the what everyone's saying, the fact that the law is unique to this area. But I'm still not comfortable with the 30 feet at the front. But um, you all might just want to make a motion and. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll move that we approve the variance and uh, I don't feel as, 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 as strongly, but I will say that, uh, that based on the, uh, some of the issues that were raised in terms of sight lines and not whatnot, that we'll approve a 35 foot um, setback on Rosemary Lane and that we also approve the house orientation on the uh, unit uh, B so that it could face Hutton Drive. What, what's the required setback? Is it 40? Uh, I, I believe think it's it was 50 something. 50 57 something feet. So that's right. That's a good and they, they had requested 30, and I'm proposing 35. Okay, that they be set back 35. That they be, that, that they be set back 35, uh -huh. an additional five feet from what they proposed. Okay. If there wasn't a contextual street setback, would it be a 40 foot setback? from the bulk regulations? Uh, it would be the more restrictive of the chart versus the plat. I'll have to look up the chart. I don't know off the top of my head. Mr. Chairman, the table at 1712030A specifies 40 feet, 20 if it were a minor local and local street. I haven't seen the MCSP designation for these streets, but 20 on the minor local and local streets, all other streets, 40 feet. Uh, and then the plat says 30, according to what the appellants have explained here today. Okay. All right. I, there, was, uh, there is a motion on the table. I don't know that it has been seconded. I don't think so. Is there? There's a motion and there's a second. Uh, for a 35-foot uh, setback on Rosemary and the ability to orient the Unit B toward Hutton. Is there any more discussion based on any information that we just have learned or thought? Okay. If, if not, then we will vote. Uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. aye. Uh, opposed? That passes 5 to 0. Good luck. Next case, 2019-141, involving property of 4243 Eaton's Creek Road, requesting a special exception for a daycare. Is the appellant here on this property? Mm -hmm. Before you is a zoning map showing you the zoning is RS-15. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the home and the surrounding area. Site plan before you now, and finally the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 141? There is. So the appellant will have 10 minutes to make your desired presentation. Please state your name and address before speaking to the board. I'm Jimmy Larkin, the Larkin Group, representing Brittany Fitzgerald, who already has a uh, daycare in her home with seven children. 
Uh, she wants to stay within the guidelines of the state where she can increase that to under 12, but it happens to be in a special exception neighborhood. And so uh, she's uh, asking for permission to stay within the guidelines for uh, the state to increase to the minimum, uh, to the maximum of 12 children, less than 12 children. And then do you, is this currently your home? Uh, yes, sir. And so this is currently where you have a daycare with seven children mm -hmm. and you just want to add five children? Yes, sir. And she has not identified herself. I'm sorry, ma'am. Yeah, tell us who you are. And <laughs> My name is Brittany Fitzgerald and I live at 4243 Edens Creek Road. And I think this, uh, Ms. Lamb, I think this is the first case that we've heard uh, with our new members about a daycare. Can you, you tell us why we hear daycare? Sure, so special exceptions, um, daycares in residentially zoned areas require special exception approval from the board. Special exceptions set forth specific criteria for the board to meet similar to variance. Um, it, in, in that there are specific criteria for you to consider. Different from a variance in that if you determine that the applicant meets those um, criteria or those requirements, then the approval should be granted. Basically, it's something that codes cannot do administratively. The board has to make a finding on those criteria. If you find those criteria, then the um, permit should be granted. In this particular case, for a daycare, it's 1716-160C. Um, and the criteria is it's subparts one through, I believe, seven, um, or eight, rather. So those are the specific criteria for the board to consider. And, and the planning department also looks at those when they make their recommendation and they'd recommend it to approve this. That's right. Planning department per the Metro Code is required to make recommendations on special exceptions. In this particular case, they have um, the recommendation should be before you. They analyze it based on context, land use policy, et cetera. Um, and in this particular um, case, they have recommended approval of this request. Mr. Chairman, one worthy note for our newer board members is also the reminder that the state carefully regulates daycare homes, daycare centers, and other business operations of that type. That's specifically identified in our zoning code that anybody would have to, of course, meet all the requirements of the state uh, governing agency. Um, I know for newer members, sometimes there are lots of questions about, now, wait a second, what, are, what kind of uh, property are we talking about? And are we talking about animals on the property? And is there appropriate fencing for a play area? Those, govern, those things are governed through the state regulations for the most part. So just as an assurance, this is far from being the last stop along the way to getting into compliance with the law. Any other questions for our zoning experts and staff? Okay. That's I just want to also add, I uh, live in the neighborhood myself, and I just want to share with the board, this is not a commercial daycare. And I say that because a lot of residents, when they see a special exception sign, they get nervous. Hey, they're trying to run a business in here. But it's a, day, it's a home care, home daycare. And I uh, just want to bring that point up. Okay. Did you have anything else to add at this point? Um, yeah, just as he said, I, this is the, like my second step where I have to go through the licensing uh, process with DHS. And so um, I'm just looking for permission to um, be able to keep four more children. Okay. And offer the proper care that I need through DHS. Okay. So for love. Great. Uh, and there's opposition, and so they will have a chance to speak, and when they're done, you will have seven minutes and 26 seconds uh, for rebuttal to speak again. Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Annie Kinzer, and I am the owner of the property at 4234 Edens Creek. Uh, I am in opposition of the daycare, uh, the day home, uh, because of, first of all, it's, it's not uh, secured. There's no fence. Uh, the, the property backs up to Edens Creek, uh, which a lot of times uh, the water do get up there, and it's on a very busy street. There are no sidewalks on that street. Uh, also, it just allows uh, opportunity for other businesses or other homes to create their own business uh, that they so see fit. And uh, my uh, other concerns are the, the uh, 
uh, control of the children. Uh, you're talking about uh, 12 children. Okay, who's going to control if it's going to be more than 12? Uh, who's going to control uh, the, uh, um, let's see, the, the staff, uh, the inspection of the home, uh, monitoring of the children and their ages? Uh, you start out with uh, saying you want uh, to cut the age off at six months to five years. Who's to say that it don't go past that? Or who's to say that it don't go past the, uh, the stated uh, requirement for uh, will serve 12 children ranges from six weeks to five years? Who's going to monitor these children? Five-year-old children are very busy children, and I observed the property yesterday uh, as well as today. And, you know, there are children outside, and there was one person uh, watching the children. Uh, that person was, uh, had the phone in their hand, uh, not really, you know, being attentive to the children. And it's my concern that when you got this many children uh, you're trying to maintain, uh, there's just a whole lot of uh, other things that can happen, and especially the property not being secured, and it's just, uh, to me, it's, it's just not a good situation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilman Jonathan Hall. I represent this district and also live one street over. Um, I'm here on behalf of several community members who have voiced concerns that both parties have mentioned today. Um, the concerns over the property itself, not only the fact that it backs up to a creek that there's easy access to. We struggle with Eaton's Creek as a very busy intersection and roadway. I'm dealing with some things that'll come before planning and others where we're trying to get a traffic light at the end of this street on the other end because of heavy volume. Um, in addition to that, I know that the state continues to regulate some of the day-to-day -day on behalf of the daycare, but one of the things that, again, that has been mentioned by both parties is the concern over it's eight now, then 12, what would prevent from continuing? Yes, you have to go to the state for other aspects of it, but for it to continue to, whether it would expand or not. Primarily, though, it's the property itself. Um, wanting to know if there can, if there are steps that are going to be taken to secure that property from the road and from the creek. Um, so between those two factors, potential growth and the security of the property itself, I've had several residents in the neighborhood voice opposition to it. Do you think that if they, uh, if those factors were better identified, that you know, I mean, on one hand, you know, it's, I mean, the planning department says, and we, you know, we don't get a lot of daycares, but we, I've been right. on the board long enough to, to see a, enough daycare, and there always is concern, and I think it's appropriate uh, from neighbors, and you know, how's it going to work, and how are people going to drop people off, and uh, less, less with the, the folks that want 12 than the folks that want 20 or more, and, and each right. time you hit another level, you got to come back and, and ask, so uh, there's, there's that, uh, uh, I guess safety net in terms of the worry that the neighbors have to say, well, if it if it does grow more, then they have to come back and, and change that. But but I guess it, it sounds like that there may be enough concern about how it's going to work and in terms of fencing and, and safety and, and and that type of thing that uh, maybe a, a bigger plan or a, a more detailed plan could be correct. And a lot of this is information because when you're starting to have the conversations about home-based business within residential areas, home-based is one thing, but as you, again, both parties have mentioned, I don't believe that their intent is to do a commercial daycare, but that is one of the things that we've been discussing at planning on multiple things from grading permits down the line to what could defines a commercial business within a residential community. So, I, I mean, I, I think it... I mean, what I hear in, in, in this type of situation is, well, let's 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 take it off the table and talk about it, and uh, and and work out some of those details. Um, is that something that that I guess what what would you like to see us do today? Would you like us to to? Well, I, I've been in communication with with Pastor Larkin about that, and so we were talking about some of the concerns and from the neighbors that had been mentioned specifically. So I, I don't know if they're opposed to 
tabling this and circling back and meeting with the community directly to voice what steps that they would take to prevent these things prior to doing that. Because again, at, currently we're just in the position where because of those physical concerns and the lack of information that the community is aware of on how the state will regulate moving forward, and especially in terms of pr pr um, later expansion possibilities, physical features and that combined, I think it's something that should be further discussed. Do you know, uh, and, and again, I, I, I apologize to everybody around because this is only my second meeting chairing, but I, and I didn't ask the applicant if they had a, a, a community meeting. Do you, are you aware of a community meeting? No, they have not had one. All right, well, I, we'll ask the applicant when they come back, but you are something, wasn't something that you were aware of. Uh, I'm, I'm the opposer, but I did uh, talk with one of the members that was the president on the community meeting, and they have not had one. Of the, of the neighborhood association. Yeah, neighborhood there are several neighboring or connecting neighborhood associations okay. right here. Well, we'll ask the applicant uh, about that uh, specifically when they come back. But uh, again, I, that usually is the very first question that should be asked, and I didn't ask that. And so uh, we'll, we'll get that information when they come back. But, but it, it, it is your position that you would like more time to talk about some of the details. Yes. Okay. And it, how how long would that be a month uh, 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 two meetings or one um, meeting well uh, you can ask the applicant ask when they come they back timetable on what it would take to produce that particular information and to be able to clarify from the state standpoint on terms of regulation and then uh, we i think we can determine how many meetings okay Oh, great, thank you. Thank you. Any, uh, no, there, I have a question. Uh, hey, Council, me, Council guys, person, just hey, can I? They, there's just, we have, one, the board has a question for one more, the opposition. One question. Okay, for the, sure. These, these, are, these are not like variances, these special exceptions. It's not about whether there's a hardship. We, if, if, if uh, the zoning administrator determines that, that they have met certain the requirements for a special exception, they're supposed to get it. And what they've done is they've looked through all the factors and determined Correct. that they've met all of them. Are there any of them? I wanted the chance to ask you before you, uh, while you're here, are there any, are any, are there any factors that, that you're contending are not met? Safety. Well, I mean, the primary one is the safety issue around the physical property. Um, I'm a kid that grew up on the next street. I, I know it was very easy and still is, for, you know, for anybody to get into that creek bed. The neighbors on adjacent sides along the same place, none of those lots are fenced. On, on Eaton's Creek as you come down that road. So it's easy access both to that and the road. And you guys know firsthand our struggles with trying to get sidewalks in that area. And so we're still in the midst of a, a 30 year push to get some sidewalks along that area. I've got Cumberland Elementary one street over and I still don't have any there. So it's, it, it is primarily a safety issue. Okay, so one of, the, one of the requirements for the special exception is that if you have a play area it, it has to be fenced. No play area. Um, fenced. Are you saying that that, that requirement not is not met? Well, I, I was, and that's why I was deferring to the applicant that they may have plans in place or be working toward that, but as of this point, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Thank you, sir. We've heard from your council members and that had, uh, I guess first let me ask, did you have a community meeting? Uh, yes, I had a community meeting on uh, April 9th. Have I did you? make a mistake in my um, community letter. It actually said April 7th, Tuesday, April 7th. And so I posted it around the house just in case somebody walked up on the 7th and showed that it was on actually on April 9th. Did you have anybody attend? Nobody came. Who got the notice to come? Where did you send the notices? To the people that lived around me, 600 feet around me, from the list that was sent to me. So, and I guess, do you have any, I mean, you know, based on, I mean, based on the kind of the, the mistake that was, and again, I know you mm -hmm. had said, hey, come back, 
if you want to, but based on that and, and the, your council members' uh, concern uh, over understanding what some of the details are, and you may have all those details planned and it may be a, a really quick conversation, or it may be something that, that, uh, that, that you all want to take a little longer. Would you have any opposition to defer in this case one meeting or two meetings so that you all can and get together and, and alleviate some of those concerns? Um, yes, I would like to say this as well. Um, I've been doing this for a very long time, um, maybe since I was 15 and I'm 36 years old now. Um, I worked for La Petite for three years. I went to school for this same for this same work, got my Bachelor of Science degree as well. Um, worked at La Petite for three years and worked for Metro Action for four. So I'm very aware of what needs to happen and what needs to take place. But in, in order for me to, to get there, I have to be licensed so that um, the zoning people can come in and tell me right. this is what size gate you need. This is, I'm very aware I need a gate, but right now I don't have one and I, I just, I barely take them outside. It's rare that I'll take them outside, but right. for the most point, yeah, I know that I need a fence and, you know, all of that. Right. As well as staff, it's, I need all that for licensing, period. So. Licensing pretty much take care of all of that DHS. Um, I can only have a certain amount per child, uh, adult to um, a child. Um, all of that is just a part of licensing. Right, uh, and but I think that again, since since there there was confusion over the letter, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and and again, to, you know, we've we've heard a, a lot of these before, and it's not many that um, mm -hmm. the district council member comes and and asks for more time to, to talk through some of the issues. Um, and, and it's rare that we uh, ever uh, say no to a council member who mm -hmm. asked that. I, so that's why I'm, I'm asking, uh, you know, if we were to, uh, to defer this one meeting or two meetings, mm -hmm. um, could, is, would you do that? And, and I guess the question is, if they had an error in their letter that they sent, do they need to have another community meeting? Uh, if the community meeting were improperly noticed, it probably is better to err on the side of caution and re-notice it um, as required by the board rules to have the proposed. And then how much, is there is there a length of time for notice? How long is that? Uh, the the neighborhood meeting on special exceptions is a board rule and it does not contemplate. So I mean, so if we if we said, so either one meeting or two as long as they had a, a neighborhood meeting. That's right, meeting as long as that, they have um, a neighborhood meeting in the meantime. Okay. And I would, one point of clarification, not that it necessarily matters if it's going to be deferred, but I, I pointed the board to 1716160C. It's 1716160D for five to 12 individuals. Uh, the criteria are similar, um, but just as you, if you review it in the meantime. Okay. I would like to add, uh, I'm going to recommend to Ms. Fitzgerald of a community meeting and to defer, but at the same time, uh, uh, we submitted plans and uh, they were approved by the uh, right. council, the planning commission. They meet all the requirements right. except for special exception. Even the requirements for the state requirements, she's going to meet, which recalls for fencing. Yes, uh, all the regulations of the amount of staff, all that's within the state regulations. Yeah. So uh, she meets their uh, uh, thing, uh, required uh, criteria. Mm -hmm. It's just the concern. Yes, uh, I'm aware of Eden Creek passing at the rear of her yard, but as long as as she meets the state requirements, the planning commission satisfied, and zoning, you know, uh, yes, we may pass by there and say, hey, that used to be a flood area. But right. if it stays within the guidelines, it's within the guidelines. Right. And I think this is one of those, I think this is a situation where it, uh, you know, again, it's it, the, the fact that the planning commission's recommended approval and, and that it, it feels like that you've, you've jumped through almost all the hoops, but because of, of the neighborhood uh, meeting issue, uh, and, and the the uh, council member's uh, recommendation, I think it'll be better for everybody to say let's let's uh, put this off, you know, one meeting or two. And is our next meeting is is May second. The next meeting after that is so the sixteenth is May sixteenth. Um, do you have a preference for? I mean, and again, you have to have a community meeting, so you have to send out your notices again. It, Two meetings may be may give you a lot more time to do that, um, but I'd ask your preference. Um, I guess I could do May second. Okay, May second. 
One other issue I'd like to bring before the board also, the concern about uh, increasing capacity. Uh, the plans only show, uh, the plans that Larkin Group submitted only show for the meeting requirements for 12. If we go beyond that, she would have to have circular drive and all that, and that mm -hmm. brings another entire entity. So we are not asking for that. And at any time, we would have not only come before the board now, but the, all the agencies would have to re-review the submittal. Okay, and, and I'll ask the councilman, they'd like the, it, they would like to defer to May 2nd and would have to have a community meeting before that. Is that acceptable to, to you? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, ma'am, I mean, it, Oh, I just had a question. Well, I, I mean, there's, there's yeah, a, yeah, if you would just ask, it, ask, the, ask your councilman the question and, and if it relates to the deferral, like I said, that, uh, because the, the <coughs> Um, her question was around property ownership. She just wanted to know, did she actually own the property and was she able to meet those additional requirements if they became necessary? Yeah, and I, that, that I don't know. And that's something that the, I mean, if, if um, the, the code staff isn't gonna issue, you know, the, the permit if all the requirements aren't met. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that that is a requirement, but it, it, they, they will meet whatever requirements they have to meet or they won't be allowed to have a permit. That code it, it's a requirement. I had to go, I had to get permission from the land um, owner to do it. Right, so I would just, when you do the community meeting, make mm -hmm. sure you have all of that, including that in terms of your documentation. Okay. So you'll be able to show right. folks. So at, at, the, at the request of the applicant, I'll move that we defer this to May 2nd and at, with the condition that you have to have a community meeting before uh, you come back if you are for whatever reason not able to have a community meeting, uh, then you can talk to the staff and they can defer it uh, again. So I will make that motion. Second. Motion's made, seconded. I want to comment for them, um, and I won't be here May 2nd to see your presentation, but um, if you would address in that presentation, I see your site plan with the proposed fence and playground. What's not clear to me is whether or not you go directly from the home into the fenced playground? And yes. you're free to, or yes. can they address it now or do we have to? So as far as, as DHS, you have to walk out so from your door, the children have to walk into the gate. So with the parents, they will come in the gate and then come inside the house. But as for me taking them outside, they have to walk from the house into a gate, not out of the house. Into a fenced in area. Into a, yes. yes. And the plan should show that, that it comes straight from the house into the play area. Mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful for the um, people who are concerned with the security of the children. Okay. All right, so we have a motion, we have a second. Any other comments or, okay, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, that motion passes. We will see you again on May 2nd. Yeah, and, and yeah, we need to, I think a five, quick Take five a five minute, minute break. break. We're not approving a specific garage. We're just a, approving a, a side and, uh, well, we're just voting on or discussing a side and rear setback. So um, I just wanna make sure that that, 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 was, that was clear to everybody, you know, the, the difference between the, what the letter said and what's actually on our, on our plate. Um, but, but it is, the placement is something that we're definitely uh, taking up and you support. Yes, sir. Thank awesome. you very much. Hey, thank you. Thanks for being here. Next case. Next case, 2019-149, involving property at 2019A 19th Avenue South, requesting a variance from sidewalk requirements in the R6 district to construct a single family house without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. You'll see before you now the zoning map showing you the property. Oh, Emily, before we start, I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn this over to our co-chair because I have a conflict on okay. the, this case. So Chairman Taylor will be recusing himself and Vice Chair Pepper will take over this for this hearing.
Okay. So there so is opposition here. So there will be 10 minutes for each side. So 10 minutes for each side. And you can leave some for rebuttal, too. This is the area photography showing you the surrounding area. Site plan for the proposed project. Oh my God. And finally, photographs showing you the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street. So seeing that there's opposition here, you'll have 10 minutes. Please make sure you state your name and address before making your presentation. My name is Tyler Lamarino with Allard Ward Architects at 1618 16th Avenue South. Uh, this, this property um, was uh, previously a duplex um, and um, the, the Taylor family bought this property uh, last year um, and decided to turn the duplex, uh, tear it down and put a single family residence that was more in keeping with the neighborhood. Um, and so uh, they are actually not developing this, they're moving into this house for themselves. So um, we were uh, looking at the sidewalk requirements as, as part of kind of completing the, the process of getting UNO and all that to uh, move into the property. Um, and uh, being that the lot's on the corner, we have a sidewalk requirement down the side as well that kind of dead ends into has a segmented block wall that's, you know, eight feet tall in one section and is, is much shorter in the front, but the sidewalk can't go through it. Um, so uh, the sidewalk wouldn't necessarily go anywhere. Um, Public Works has asked us to um, redo the curb or, or the alley apron out of concrete as well, um, which uh, is, is, I know, not uh, necessarily in your all's um, uh, purview of, of oversight because it's a public works thing, but it is an expense as related to um, doing the sidewalk. Um, so, um, you know, it became a very expensive proposition to do a sidewalk up 187 feet plus another 20 across the alley that dead ends into a segmented block wall. Um, and then the other thing that complicates it is we have some grade issues here. Um, uh, the, the, you know, they have a nine and a half foot basement on the back of this house. So the grade is quite extreme. Um, and there are two uh, pretty substantial trees, a 24 inch walnut tree um, and a 12 inch oak that would have to be removed. Um, we've been working with uh, planning a bit to try and save one of them, but the, the uh, 24 inch walnut would probably just have to come down. Um, and you can kind of see that, that big walnut tree there in the uh, picture, uh, sort of at the nose of the blue truck there. Um, so, but why not contribute to the fund? I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Well, that's, that's what we're here to discuss. Um, you know, contributing to the fund is, you know, over $28,000. Um, being that it's 100 and, you know, I'm not exactly sure how it's calculated, but it's somewhere in that region. Um, and so we were hoping that maybe we could contribute to the fund in the amount that would have been the equivalent for the front sidewalk, which is a, a more reasonable amount. Uh, as compared to what it would cost them to uh, put the sidewalk in, which is between the two numbers. Um, so yes, they could uh, put the sidewalk in, but they lose their two trees. Uh, they'd have to spend even extra money to satisfy public works. Um, so uh, I think the front sidewalk in lieu fund would, you know, again, it'd have to be calculated, but it's somewhere between $7,500 and $9,000. Uh, whereas, you know, we could be in the twenty-eight to $30,000 mark for the side, uh, which seems like a lot uh, of burden to put on um, someone in the neighborhood, uh, considering that, you know, neighboring lots only really usually have to worry about the front and their situation specific to this lot, because they're on a corner, they're being asked to do the side too, whereas every neighbor around them um, either already had a sidewalk there's a big apartment building across, and is it four stories tall? Across Bernard and 19th, um, it doesn't have sidewalks on the other side of the street because of grade issues. Um, so uh, we're just asking for maybe pay into the front, uh, what the equivalent would be for the front uh, so we can save the trees. Um, they're substantial trees um, and, you know, I don't think the client's trying to get off not doing anything and not paying anything. Uh, they just would like to, to do it within reason and, and um, in, in hopes that, uh, you know, they would spend a reasonable amount of money in their mind. So you're saying if you don't, if you, 
if you have to pay in, the, the, as opposed to paying in, that you would build the sidewalk on the side and take out the trees? Yeah, we'd have to, if we build the sidewalk, we have to take the trees out, um, and we have to redo the apron to the alley for public works, apparently. Um, and so, are, you, are you saying it's less expensive to pay into the to, to build the sidewalk than to pay into the fund? And so yeah, but it's still expensive. I mean, it's a it's two hundred and two hundred and eight feet of sidewalk when you add the alley apron, uh, and that's really expensive too in the tens of thousands of dollars. But it's not as expensive as a thirty thousand dollar in lieu fee. Uh, so we're asking to maybe pay what would be the equivalency of the front in lieu fee. Um, which would be equivalent of what a, a neighbor would have to do that has a standard 50-foot lot like they do, except on an interior. So your your request is that you're willing to pay into the fund, but just for the front? Just yeah, the equivalent the of the front down, amount. The front. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Any questions? Can I say something sure, as well? Absolutely. Hi, I'm Jennifer Taylor. I'm the um, homeowner at 2019 19th Avenue South. And I would just add, I mean, Tyler stated everything perfectly, but I would just like to add that aside from the dollar cost of adding the sidewalks, losing those trees is a huge cost to the neighborhood. Um, I mean, part of why we built on this street was because of the tree canopy and all the all the great trees that are there, and then to take those out in order to put this long sidewalk, I think, um, would be more of an expense and more and and more harmful to the neighborhood. And we've worked really hard with Tyler and Allard Ward to build this um, home that is in keeping with the neighborhood. And and I think taking those trees out would just make it more obvious that it's a new home or that it's not part of this historic neighborhood and keeping those trees would help to preserve that. Thank you. Any, any questions? Okay, let's hear from the opposition. Uh, and you'll have three, have three minutes for a rebuttal. Is that better? Can you hear me now? All right. Hi, I'm Cynthia Hicks. I live at 1702 Ashwood Avenue. I'm the president of Belmont Hillsboro Neighbors, Inc. And I'm also on the steering committee of the 21st Avenue Corridor Study. Uh, during our last BHN steering committee meeting, we voted unanimously to oppose this variance request. And as a member of the 21st Avenue Corridor Study, we held a series of community meetings in November. Um, and one of the most important messages that we heard loud and clear was our neighbor's desire to have more and better sidewalks. Uh, this property is located about two blocks away from 21st Avenue South, and it's on the east-west street of Bernard Avenue. Um, we, we oppose the variance as it was stated in the agenda, as it were. Having heard the arguments that they have on that, my guess is that, um, or my thought is on that. I would be interested in seeing what they would want to do instead. Are those trees in an area that would constitute the planting strip that would be required on the building of a sidewalk? We in our neighborhood, we're a very walkable neighborhood. We want to see more sidewalks. We want to see more walkability in our neighborhood. That's very, very important to us, as stated from uh, the folks that were involved in the charrette from the 21st Avenue Corridor study. So I still would say we would want to see sidewalks built there. Uh, if the, We would certainly work with someone about preserving the trees because that's also a very, very important part of our neighborhood as well. But also paying into the fund if we choose not to adhere to the sidewalks. Um, that would be our, our goal there. Thank you very much. I, th I think what they're saying though, is if they build the sidewalk, they're going to have to take the trees out if you all... And they and they're mature trees, mm -hmm. so. I, I would want to see that. I would want to see exactly where those trees are, and 
If there is a way to preserve those trees, absolutely. If there's a way to make those sidewalks in a curve that goes around a tree, I think that's certainly appropriate to be able to do that because it doesn't need to be a straight shot as far as sidewalks go. But having sidewalks in our neighborhood is very, very important, especially when we're getting that close to 21st Avenue and the walkability of our neighborhood is so very important to us. Thank okay. you. Thank you. My name is Bill Wiggins. I live at 2009 20th Avenue South. Um, I have lived there, my wife and I have lived there for 26 years. We're very fond of this neighborhood. Um, I, th there are letters in your, in your packet from a number of the neighbors close by uh, who uh, also express uh, opposition to this variance uh, for, for their own reasons. Uh, I, su I submitted a letter as well, and I'm essentially going to, I know you can read, but I'm going for the record, I'm going to read it into the, to, to you and those present. Uh, so uh, I'm writing to register my opposition to the variance from sidewalk requirements at the property located at 2019A, 19th Avenue South. Uh, the appellant has cited financial burden and physical characteristics of the property as reasons for requesting this variance. I respond as follows. Concerning the financial burden, this is a new construction of a large and no doubt expensive home. The owners knew or should have known of this requirement and therefore could have figured the expense into their construction budget. Their architects and or builders could or should have apprised their, clients of, uh, their clients of this requirement and accounted for the costs before construction began. Uh, regarding the physical characteristics, it is accurate to say that there are issues with the terrain along Bernard Avenue. Granted that I am not an engineer, however, I maintain that this could be mitigated with some infill material and a retaining wall. Again, a matter which could have been addressed in the initial stages of construction. There has been reference to a property uh, across the alley from 2019 19th Avenue South. The owner of that property has erected a fence across the sidewalk easement. This is a questionable situation, which doesn't bear directly on this, but it is something that we're concerned about. The neighborhood is heavily trafficked by pedestrians people walking pets, children in strollers, exercising, walking to schools and work. The block from Portland Avenue to Bernard Avenue is surrounded on three sides by sidewalk. The section of Bernard Avenue has one section of truncated sidewalk across the property from on the north side of Bernard. That uh, is near the apartments, which are three stories, by the way. There is on-street parking on both sides of Bernard. Pedestrians are forced to walk on the street for most of the block between 19th and 20th Avenues. This is an unsafe situation. Construction of a sidewalk on this property would not totally allevi alleviate this situation, but it would provide motivation and impetus for completing the sidewalk around this block. As, the side as a sidewalk already exists, from 21st Avenue to 20th Avenue. This would result in a continuous sidewalk from 21st Avenue South to 19th Avenue South, greatly enhancing the walkability in the neighborhood. In conclusion, I urge the board to deny this appeal and require conformity to the ordinance requiring either construction of a sidewalk or payment in lieu of construction. My preference is construction of the sidewalk. And I might add, re with regard to the trees, our neighborhood is vitally interested in the tree canopy. In fact, we've held for the last, well, this Saturday we'll hold our 10th fundraiser for our tree canopy fund. We have placed many trees in the neighborhood and will continue to do that. And uh, while we would be, it would be regrettable to lose mature trees, however, we can replace those trees uh, with appropriate trees uh, um, on the property, as well as many other places around the Belmont Hillsboro neighborhood. So I, again, ask you to deny this variance. 
Thank you. Thank you. Is there any more opposition out there? Okay. The applicants have uh, three minutes, 29 seconds left. Thank you all. So I guess the opposition has made the point that that uh, this is expensive, and, and the Metro Council, when they enacted the sidewalk ordinance, didn't didn't exclude um, side. You know, if you have a corner lot, which they could have done, they didn't do that. And what they're saying is that that this is an expense that was anticipated. How would you address that? So my name is Denny Taylor. I am the owner of the house at 2019 19th Avenue South. And, Currently reside in a rental house on 2113 18th Avenue South, which is literally a block away, which we have lived in for almost two years. And we had previously been at 621 Royal Oaks Place in Bellmeter for the previous 20 years. Um, the, um, the, the what, what was this question specifically? Well, the the, the opposition raised the point that uh, this this could have been this you should have anticipated this expense. On the front end, the, the uh, there is a, I, I guess it, the the ordinance code is a little bit confusing, and the um, I don't know that the, the from my understanding is the amount has varied over time according to my builder, uh, and that may not be true, but that's what he's told me. So maybe I couldn't pinpoint that expense, um, and furthermore, there's lots of variations that go into a house when you. You build it to the prices. The ultimate cost goes up and down over time. I think everybody would agree with that. I don't think anybody would have expected us to have to actually do the apron on the alley, which to me is not even. Which, admittedly, by the city and the public works, is not even in the ordinance itself. It's just what they want to see. But we're being held hostage a little bit. Um, so but, my, and we we don't have any say over. Public I, I recognize. Works. I, mean, that's, that's, I, I recognize that. But what I'm saying is that. I mean, I, I, I can't pinpoint the exact amount. I guess I could have ultimately gone down and said, here's what the fund is, but I didn't know what the sidewalk cost was going to be until we went through the bidding process. I understand. So I, I think this boils down to a couple things. Um, first of all, I am an engineer. I'm a civil engineer by original training, so I do know a, a lot about this. Um, we're not against sidewalks. But what I am against is I don't think it's fair or consistent to have to pay $28,000 into a sidewalk fund for 189 feet for something that the city probably didn't ultimately envision, thought was, I mean, that doesn't, that probably didn't come up when they came up with the rule. So that would have been an expense that I don't think in the magnitude I would have expected. Um, so we're happy to basically do one of two things. We're happy to build the sidewalk if that's what you all want, or we're happy to pay into the side fund, which we think is a reasonable amount or if there's some other amount that you think is reasonable, we're happy to do that. It's, it, we're not trying to get out of doing nothing. And if the city wants to come back and use that money and put it in a sidewalk, we're very happy to have a sidewalk along the house. But I don't think it's, it should be our burden to put in an extra fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 into a fund that doesn't probably appropriately represent what's on the side of our house. And I would just say also, at t for a sidewalk that really essentially doesn't go anywhere and the rest of Bernard doesn't have it, the houses behind us didn't have it, I mean, when, just to his point about fairness, I mean, for it to go, you know, into the alley and then there's a retaining wall and a fence and then the rest of Bernard up until almost till 21st, there are no sidewalks. So it's just, at that point, the fairness issue is. And if, and if they rebuild or remodel, they may have to pay into the sidewalk fund too. That's, that's, that's what triggers it. And, um, and I understand you're, you actually, for a lot of houses in Davidson County, the, 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 the frontage of your, art, your yard is not, it's, it's a 50 foot lot, is that so right? It's 50 so foot. 50 foot, so I understand the side is, is you know, well over 50 feet. Um, is <clears throat> I want to get some clarification. I'm kind of lost on what what is where. The planning staff has recommended three things that we approve, but with these conditions. And it appears from reading this, there's already a sidewalk along 19th Avenue, and that you're to maintain it in good condition. Um, and any portion that's not ADA compliant is to be removed and replaced in kind. Is that sidewalk not where the trees are? Are the trees on the other side? 
There's one tree on the other side, and the and there's one on the corner as it pretty okay. much on the well, other I side. I can't really tell from the pictures, and I don't. I don't if you pull up the previous one. pictures, can you? Yeah, that's the picture I was looking at. But okay, I can't tell. that there. No, can you the other one right right here? So, if you see that tree on the top left picture, the tree on the right, that's inside of the the uh, the sidewalk on the lot on the actual lot, that tree would have to come down. And then on the picture on the right, where you have the blue tr pickup truck. Excuse me, it would have to come down if what? If you put the sidewalk in along Bernard. Oh, okay. And then that tree that's on the, on the picture on the right, where you have the blue pickup truck and the white van, there's a tree beyond that. That is all Bernard. And if you put the sidewalk, that tree is gonna have to come down because it's gonna die. Well, we have in the past allowed people that were on a corner lot to only contribute to one side because um, and even, even though it's not in the code as written, I think you may be right that that wasn't considered at the time the code was written. And nobody supports this sidewalk ordinance more than I do, but I want it to be fair to everyone. And Lord knows we all need more sidewalks in our communities. I'm so scared I'm gonna run over someone who doesn't have a sidewalk and they're walking either in the street or too close. I experience that almost every day in my community. And so I want you all to have sidewalks, but I just wanted to make sure what are we really talking about? The sidewalk that is there is on 19. You're being asked to put one, well, to dedicate right away along Bernard or Bernard, however you say that to accommodate that grass strip and sidewalk. I just wanted to make sure I understood clearly what, because I really couldn't tell from the pictures. Thank you. Anything further? Okay, thank y'all very much. We'll close the public hearing and deliberate. So what what planning staff recommends is, is contribute to the in lieu fund for the Bernard Avenue footage, maintain the existing sidewalk along 19th, and then dedicate a strip uh, along Bernard Avenue. Um, what are y'all's thoughts on that? Well, I'll go with the planning department's recommendation. I do think they'll lose the trees, unfortunately. Um, they may fall within that four foot grass strip, but the root canopy or the roots underneath um, are probably going to be killed by the new construction. But without the urban forester here, I don't, I don't know for sure, but that's what seems they seem to be saying. But I will say a long time ago when we first started with these sidewalk variances, we had um, some cases that came to us that and Alma might remember $300,000 to build a sidewalk. So $28,000 pales in comparison to um, those cases that we used to see. Um, but I'm for the, the planning department's recommendation. Is that a motion? Sure, I will uh, move um, that the applicant um, abide by the planning department's recommendation. So You'll, you'll move approval with the conditions. Yes, thank I'll, you. I'll second that. Any discussion? I'm still not comfortable with that because I think if they've got to do both sides, and maybe I'm not clearly understanding, but I, I believe that I heard that. The, uh, um, that's not what not planning's a, recommending. Yeah, they're, planning's recommending they contribute yeah, the I, in I, lieu of yeah. along Bernard and then maintain the sidewalk on 19. And as planning pointed out in their uh, recommendation, Ms. Sanford, I don't know if you've had a chance to review that, but they did, according to planning, the sidewalk on 19th Avenue is compliant with the, with the code requirements. Even though it says if it's not in ADA compliance. Um, well, that's just saying, I don't know that they're saying it's not in compliance. I think they're saying that's for public wor works to look at. If there, if it is not in compliance with the ADA, which is different from our code requirements regarding sidewalks, if the current sidewalks have any ADA violations, they would be required to bring it into compliance with the so ADA. So what we're saying, the cost that they would have is they have to contribute in lieu to Bernard, 
but not necessarily incur any costs on 19. And the, co the real cost on burner is the trees. Any further discussion? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay. So we, uh, the, we will, uh, you, you have 30 days in which to bring the, bring the, am I right? Well, it will actually, it will automatically be moved to the next docket. Okay, it's automatically um, moved to the next docket, which is when? Although Ms. Chappell will not be here, Ms. Carbonek has already voted, and Mr. Taylor has had to recuse himself, so I may need to recuse it, uh, move it to the 16th, which will give Ms. Chappell an opportunity to return. Um, okay. And that's still within the 30-day window. Okay, so May 16th is... May 16th is, is that May 16th, okay. So you'll, and will they be automatically put back on the docket for May 16th? Okay, so it'll be automatically put back on the docket for May 16th. Can I ask it, if there's a different motion that someone else would like to make? Would that be? Uh, sure. Does anybody have a, that? Does anybody have a different motion with respect to this property? Um, so I guess what I struggle with on this particular one is that they're not saying they're not, they don't want to pay. They're saying they didn't want to pay on the side where there's these two. I found the two mature trees argument more compelling than anything else. Um, so from my perspective, if they paid in, the, in lieu of fee for the part of the house that the house actually fronts, which is 19th, and then dedicate the right away to all the other conditions the same. The only difference I would make to planning's recommendation is contribute the in lieu of fee based off the frontage of 19th, which is what they proposed, if I understood what you guys proposed. So I'm, I support planning with just that one tweak. So that was my only thing. Because I do recognize they're on a corner lot and the back, the part of the corner that they do face is a part that doesn't have existing, and then there's some unique characteristics to the B Bernard Street that I'm sensitive to, because I do think with all the new building that we're doing in Nashville, we are losing a lot of our mature trees, and to the extent that we can save those but also pay into the sidewalk fee, that seems like a nice balance to me. So that's what I was thinking. Okay, so you're, can you, do you want to make a motion out of that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I would move that we grant the variance and we incorporate planning staff's conditions for the approval of the variance with the exception that the, the applicant contributes to the in, lo, in lieu fee based on the frontage of 19th Avenue. Okay. And I can second that. Okay, what about the other, uh, or does your motion include any, any of the other conditions of? Yes, I would say they have to maintain the existing sidewalk conditions on 19th and as well dedicate the right of way on <coughs> Bernard in case the city ever did decide they wanted to build a sidewalk. Okay, any further discussion on that? Does everybody understand the motion? Okay, <laughs> all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? No. So we're still back to May 16th. Uh, you need four votes, so you're, you'll be automatically put on the docket on May 16th. Can we just build the sidewalk in compliance with the city? Yeah. We just go ahead and do that? Or does it include stuff? Okay. Yeah. Thank you all. Somebody getting Mr. Taylor, okay.
All right, next, next case. case for the board to consider is case 2019-150 involving property at 423 and 425 Mallory Street, requesting a variance from setback requirements to construct two single family houses with the parking pad within the front setback. As you'll see before you, the zoning map shows the zoning of the property is R6A. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Before you is a proposed site plan for this project, and finally the photography giving you the sense of the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 150? Seeing none, Dwayne Cuthbertson will have five minutes to make his desired presentation. Um, he has an updated site plan that he submitted that failed to make the presentation, so we will submit that to the board. I believe that's been presented to the board. Um, and he can walk you through that as well. Um, no opposition, so Mr. Cuthbertson, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation. Please identify yourself by name and address. Uh, um, a question is, the, did uh, planning make a recommendation on the new site plan? This is a variant. Uh, this, did they make a, I thought you were gonna. This is a variant, so they didn't. Okay. Ramsey. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm this sorry. Is we're getting confused between a couple of cases that Mr. Mr. Cuthbertson likes to make it difficult for us. This is a variance, not a special exception, so there is no recommendation required by planning. Nick, yes, I apologize. I, I, I saw the picture and was thinking of another case. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Should I, should I allow for a few seconds for that site plan to circulate? It sh I think it should be in the packet. I hope so. Yeah, it should be in the packet. It just didn't make it into the presentation. Sorry, my frequent flyer miles might be causing the confusion. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't see. I see it. It's. I would hope the site plan you you have shows landscaping between the parking pads and the street. Okay. Um, I'd also ask, is the elevation in the packet as well? If it was submitted to us, it should it be. I don't have, uh, let me look at the packet. Hold on. That's the, the site plan. Um, there should be an elevation in your packet as well. It shows a two-story, two, two-story houses. Uh, yes. So those are important as those were part of the discussion that I've had with the community and the council member. Uh, and I'll submit to you that he was supportive of our request subject to uh, some of those conditions, but one of those being that elevation. Uh, so Dwayne Cuthbertson, 1806 Allison Place. Uh, I am uh, here before you representing the owners of 423 Mallory uh, in their request for a variance to allow parking pads in, in the front setback in the R6A district. Uh, their intent is to construct two dwellings as shown uh, on those site plans in front of you. Uh, this particular lot is, um, it's, it's particularly shallow compared to the average R zone lots. It's also uniquely shaped as you'll see. Uh, there's only 88 feet of depth on the west side of this property, and then it angles back uh, to, to a dimension that's uh, a, a little bit uh, deeper, but still considerably shallow, again, compared to your average R-zone lot. Um, another factor uh, that's, that's playing into our, our hardship, or our unique circumstances, is that there's a public sewer line that runs along the west side of this property, and it also angles uh, along the back side of this property. And so with that public sewer comes the associated uh, public uh, utility easement that's uh, further constricting this lot. So the, the R6A district, the intent behind that is to preserve neighborhood character. And uh, one of those requirements is that you cannot park in the front setback. Uh, so we're asking for a variance of that and, and 
uh, we feel like this lot is kind of forcing our hand uh, with, with as it relates to design. If this were a normal shape lot, we wouldn't be before you. We could put a house behind a house and fit the parking in, or we could bring a common driveway down and we'd have plenty of room in the back. Um, another factor that I'll touch on too is stormwater, uh, and I'll get back to that, but uh, the, the, the owners of this property, they designed a site plan that showed two really skinny houses, 17, and a, 17 feet wide. Uh, they ran a driveway through the center and put uh, a, a parking pad in the rear. Um, but when you factor in the front setback, reasonable depth for homes, uh, the shallowness of this lot, that left them with about 10 feet of space between the parking pad and the back of the property. Well, that's the public utility easement. So if you try to put that site plan in front of stormwater, every one of them down there is going to say, can't do it. They will not allow um, stormwater uh, treatment. Uh, within public utility easements. Well, this lot slopes down to the very back corner. That's where the stormwater goes. So uh, we can't put that stormwater treatment up front or uh, really in the side of this property. So, so stormwater effectively asked us if we would redesign this site and try to work with the community and work with the council member and, uh, uh, and pursue a, a variance uh, to to place the parking up front. So the clients went back to the drawing board. They came back with a site plan with two houses that were uh, a little bit wider. Um, I would also submit that the, the first site plan had homes at 17 feet wide and they were three story houses. Uh, the new site plan contemplates 19 foot wide homes, but they're, also, they're, they're only two stories uh, in height. Um, so they came back with that site plan that leaves plenty of room in the back for stormwater, uh, but it, it does force our hand and ask to put parking in front of the houses. We've worked with a few members of the community. We've also worked with the council member. Um, in order to kind of meet halfway, we have committed to uh, effectively shielding these parking pads from the street. Um, the site plan only shows seven evergreen trees up there, but we are committed to shielding those parking pads. So if seven evergreen trees doesn't shield it, they'll add uh, landscaping between that parking pad and the street. Um, they'll also, they're also committed to shifting that parking pad just a little so there's landscaping between the ends of the parking pads and adjacent property owners. Um, uh, so uh, again, this is a pretty active neighborhood. Uh, uh, council member, he blasts all BZA requests out to the community. Uh, we submitted notices. We've talked to a handful of neighbors and, and everybody that we've talked to has been supportive with the conditions that it be limited to a two-story house two-story house in 28 feet, uh, which is what's shown in that elevation that you guys have, um, as well as shielding the parking pads. Um, and so uh, we, we feel like this is, this is a reasonable solution. We feel like that there are unique circumstances with just this particular lot uh, in this neighborhood. And with that, we'd uh, request your <coughs> so support the, the on the So the site plan shows, I mean, it looks like the, on the site plan that the, the drive is uh, pavers or is it that's yeah that's part of their treatment is that they have to use pavers so they have to use a pervious surface in the front yes to try to reduce um, I'm losing my I forget the term but basically uh, <laughs> reduce the amount of runoff okay I've got a question you said you gave us a lot of good information um, if the, just putting all the other things you set aside, if the parking was in the back, mm. then you would have to push the homes up and they would no longer meet the contextual setback from the street, is that right? We, we'd, we would have to shift everything up so that we had enough room between the, the, the utility easement and the parking pads so that we could put modified French drains or some sort of stormwater treatment in between there. Uh, it would force their hand and they'd, they'd have to, the homes would have to be taller for sure. And everybody involved felt like, again, shielding the parking in two stories was a better outcome. Also, I was under the impression from the zoning code that parking is allowed in the required street setback. It just shall not exceed 12 feet. In width. You can have a driveway. If you don't have an alley, you can have a driveway in that front setback, but 
that driveway width is limited to, I think it's 12 feet. You cannot have parking in the front setback. Now, some people have cheated the system, and if your setback's at 27, I've seen people push those houses back to 50 feet, and so then they place their parking pads between 27 and 50 feet, so it, it looks like it's in this front setback, but it's not in the front, the technical front setback, if that makes sense. Yeah, I read, I read it differently. I may have an older version of um, the alternative for the alternative zoning districts, but it sounded like parking is allowed in the front. Just not, uh, you might want to check oh, out 17.12 um, .020 a and note five. Okay. We've been, we've been kicked out on that a few times. So I'd That's interesting, I'm learning something here. Okay. Mm -hmm. It looks like note five has been repealed. I don't have a note five in my, it says reserved, which usually indicates that it is no longer part of the code. Okay, so when, so the information about the alternative zoning districts went away. That Just particular the, note that, that you're that looking at. There's an entire table for the alternative zoning districts under 17, 12, okay. 020 D is involved. Emily, were there, I, I don't see a letter or any communication from uh, Council Member Sledge. Were there other uh, proposed conditions besides the three that were mentioned? That well, the assumption is the pervious surface, uh, the shift of, uh, of the pad to allow landscaping with the neighbor, and uh, completely shielding the parking pad through landscape. Uh, completely shielding the. Sorry. Okay, yeah, it's on now, right? Ross, could you pass my Title 17? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> were were um, there any other conditions besides those three? No conditions that were officially offered from the council person. I believe Dwayne has talked to him and can weigh in on that. Yeah, and I forwarded you an email only like two days ago where Colby... Well, I saw it, but it wasn't okay. officially... I didn't receive it from him, so I'm going to oh, let you... Oh, sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. I'm just, I want to um, let you def uh, relay your conversation with him. Yeah, so there were... Um, so the conditions were, in my, from Colby, what, what he gave me was, if you'll limit the building heights to 20, two stories and 28 feet, um, and if you will completely shield the parking pads, the previous pavers weren't necessarily a condition, but we'd accept it. That's what they're going to do. Um, but it was shield the parking on the three sides, and, and specifically, he, more importantly for him was the building height, two stories and 28 feet. Which, any other questions? Anything else to, to add? No, sir. All right, we'll close public hearing. Thoughts? I'm persuaded by Colby Sledge's uh, opinion about it. If yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I think that there is a little bit of a unique situation. Um, and, you know, every time we get an R6A that is asking for, you know, a front-loaded garage or something like this, I, I think to myself, well, I hope this is the last one I hear. Uh, and because I know R6A is, is, is intentionally meant to, to avoid this, but uh, I think this is the kind of situation where because of the, the uniqueness it, um, and, and the working with the council member and the solution that's proposed that it is something to, to consider. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't see approving it without the conditions that we have listed and, uh, and, and appreciate those uh, being worked out uh, to some extent, uh, you know, in advance, but I don't know what other folks are thinking. Um, I just, the only question I had was about the email about stormwater that was in our packet. Um, it sounds like the applicant has worked with the councilman and has made a lot of concessions and negotiations. I was just wondering um, how stormwater would fit into all of this. Yeah, and the, the email I thought, and, and if you, the email I thought said that they would prefer <laughs> the front rather than the back, but if you, don't mind, if you don't mind, I open public hearing and let the applicant yeah. ask that question. 
Would you address that uh, comment? But, I think you forwarded the email, your conversation with, with Kimberly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What was the specific question? Um, and I'm going off of memory because like. Uh, so she sort of talked about. Um, I think you've already addressed it. I just wanted to be sure that that was what you were saying that connected to stormwater about um, having front loading parking in our garages will reduce the amount of impervious area being added to the site, thus providing more green space for stormwater runoff. Is that what you were sort of talking about earlier? That's yeah. how you guys addressed it? That's yeah. all up. Okay. Yeah. I didn't connect that in my head, and I just wanted to make sure I understood. So okay. thank you. All right. We will close the public hearing again. Um, I'll, th I'll throw a motion out that that we ap approve the variance um, with the condition that the parking pad be uh, made of pervious pavers, that it be completely shielded uh, through landscaping uh, of the type that was submitted in the plan, and that the building, uh, the two homes be limited to two stories and 28 feet and that the parking pad also be shifted uh, in a way to provide landscaping between uh, the neighboring property. I can second that. We have a motion, we have a second. Any other discussion? Not about that, but the note five I was referring to, it's now note eight, just for your information. I mean, I've looked it online here. So. That really doesn't have any. All right. <laughs> Just wanted to correct myself. There. Right. If no other comments or, th or uh, discussion, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes five to nothing. Thank you. Next case, 2019-156, involving property at 1016 Delmas Avenue, requesting variances from rear and side setback to construct a garage. Zoning map here shows you the zoning of the property as R6. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Proposed site plan is submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property in the recent photographs. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 156? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes. Please make uh, state your name and address. Sure. Uh, my name is Wayne Johnson. Uh, my wife and I live at 1016 Delmas Avenue. Um, currently, we have no garage at, at the house, and uh, there's an old tool shed in the rear of the property. Uh, <clears throat> we're zoned for a, a 750-square-foot garage with a three-foot setback in the rear of the property, uh, which is a two-and-a-half-stall garage, approximately 24 by 30. Uh, our home has no basement for storage. And we have three vehicles that we would like to, to park in the garage. So we're asking for a variance to build 24 by 40 foot uh, garage with a three foot rear setback. Yeah, and, and let me uh, as stop just for a second because yeah. I, I don't know if you heard when the council member was uh, asking us to support this plan. Mm -hmm. uh, I did make reference to the letter that you had submitted saying that you wanted 960 feet and you could build 725, but the actual, our docket just is requesting a variance from the side and the rear setback. It, it's, it's, I don't think that the garage size is part of what we're. It appears that the garage size, um, although perhaps contemplated by the applicant, was not adequately noticed, was not adequately appealed. And so if that is, the board, what's before the board today is the setbacks, as you stated. If he would like additional size on the garage, it will need to be re-noticed, so probably deferred, and then new notices sent out to give notice of what is actually being requested, and then it could, that could be considered by the board. Alternatively, you could vote on the setbacks today, and he could file another application for the size. But for time's sake, it probably would be easier just to defer it and um, re-notice it. Well, and, it, and you'd have to pay to... You'd have to pay another application fee. If we deferred it, you wouldn't have to pay anything. You just have to re-notice it. That's right. Yeah, but can I ask a question? But isn't it? But we're currently zoned with, without a variance for a seven seven hundred fifty square foot garage with a three foot setback. Is that correct? We can check that for you. And that's what I need to know because what I'm asking is basically, the, we want the garage there. We just want to make the footprint a little right. bigger. But that's okay. not what well, was. It, uh, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, all, all, all we have on our uh, agenda is a, a request for a setback variance, not a size variance. It sounds like you want both. And so if you do want both, mm -hmm. and, and if, if you are eligible to have, say, three feet with a 700 foot garage, we can't address the 900 foot garage because that's not on our agenda and that's not what was noticed to the public. So okay. they can help you um, after the meeting or uh, at a, you know, some other time uh, to get the right notice and we can hear this again, but how much notice wow. do you, is it 30 days? 21 days, so, so the, the best meetings. case would be two meetings. That'll give him 30 days to get, he'd have to come in pretty quickly to get the notice. Um, Jessica's had enough time for our office to handle yeah, the notices. So this was the a, next meeting I think this was a mishap on the planning department because they helped me put together the variance what I was asking. The law requires the, the notice that we've described here today. We're going to help you do that, regardless okay. of if that is exactly the case. The law still requires that notice right. to be I done, so we're going to help get you that. get that together. I get that, but, you know, but we're going to lose the building s season if I don't get on it. So yeah. It's Nashville building season. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so, so the yeah. best we can do for you today is to defer this uh, for the, the fastest is two meetings, uh, but that, again, depends on you getting this uh, notice out 21 days before that second, that two meetings. Uh, so I'll move that we defer this to the 16th of May. Okay. Is there a second? And what, and what would I be asking for that? You'll work with me on that, right? Okay, okay. All right, so there's been a motion and a second to defer this to the 16th of May. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. All right, this is uh, deferred until the 16th of May, and if you will meet with the staff uh, either after the meeting or give them a call in the morning, they will get it all figured okay. out for you. Now, Councilman Davis is on record supporting this, so do I need to have him come back in or anything? He probably doesn't, but once you step aside, let us help walk you through yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, next case. Next case, 2019-161, involving property at 5555 Hill Road, requesting a variance from front and side setbacks to construct a detached carport. Before you is the zoning map showing you the lot as well as the zoning is R40. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Proposed site plan for the showing you the, the existing house as well as the proposed carport and the location of that carport. And finally, the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 161? Seeing none, the appellant will have... Are you here in opposition to this case? In support, okay. Um, so seeing no opposition, the appellant will have five minutes to make your desired presentation. Please identify yourself by name and address. If within that five minutes your support would like to speak, she's welcome to do that as well. Uh, my name is Nancy Stilwell Duckett. I reside at 409 Springer Court, Brentwood, Tennessee. I'm here representing Andrew C. Johnson at 5555 Hill Road, Brentwood, Tennessee. Um, Mr. Johnson is wanting to build a carport in um, the probably north northwest side of his property. Um, he has a large pie-shaped um, plot of land, um, and the house sits on the larger part of the lot. And then he has um, put, and you can see that, a uh, parking pad on the smaller um, kind of triangular shape. I don't, one of the pictures this isn't his land, but... Um, triangular shape, and uh, the backyard is um, small and really doesn't, isn't um, cohesive for any kind of carport or um, shed or anything like that. Um, so he would like to put a carport for vehicles, primarily, possibly a boat. Um, the primary primary reason he'd like to do that is uh, for safety, but also um, the, he has a two-car attached garage in the bottom part of his home, but apparently that's not enough. So you said safety. Uh, it's a well-traveled road. Hill Road is a well-traveled road, and it's also um, has quite a bit of people walking. Um, so so how, how does the carport provide more safety than a pad, a parking pad? 
um, I would think that people having your car out just outside in a driveway um, lends uh, people just walking to be able to get into it a whole lot easier than wanting to go inside of a structure. Um, also, um, it would be designed and completed in the same fashion as his house. So it would, once completed, it would look exact, or not exactly, but in the same manner as his home. So it would look like it had existed um, at the same time his house was built. Um, and it would be tasteful. And could, I'm could, sorry uh, that I'm not as eloquent as sorry. I'd like to be. <laughs> Is it? So there's an existing drive, I'm looking at the site plan, and there's an existing driveway. Is it, was it be possible to build this structure in, in that existing driveway area where you had parking and you still met the side and front setback? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, it, it, looks like, it looks like all that concrete's new. So is that a new parking pad? Yes, it's brand new. So they poured a new parking pad and started a garage and then had realized they had to... Well, the garage wasn't supposed to be started. That was a total mishap and miscommunication. Um, there, were, there were plans to be set and he went out of town and I went out of town and he had hired a, somebody and they got started on it without his permission. And then they everything went to a halt because there were not permits and there were not, and that's when I came in. So I'm looking at the site plan. It almost looks like you could just take that structure and just move it right over. It almost would fit perfectly right next to the house and be in the driveway and it would probably still meet the setbacks for the front and the side. Uh, yes, it may. I don't know if they, well, I don't know if they would have the turnaround room. Um, I don't know if that's even something they considered, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. I think he was trying to use, to utilize that unique shape of the property and still have area to work with. I don't know, to be honest. Well, I mean, I think if he did that, if he if he moved it over, talking about you could you could still have a, a driveway where he's planning to put the you could still have a turnaround space there. Yes, sir. So, uh, I mean, it's it's a unique shaped lot. I see that, but uh, I'm just trying to figure out why it has to be all the way over in this very far corner, with no setback really at all from the front or the side. So. That's a good question. It, it is, I, I know because I live in the subdivision and he does not, it was like a leftover just space. It really wasn't even a lot from when they built the subdivision. And it just was, that's why it's so weird looking. I understand, thank you. Yes. And is the homeowner out of town or is it or unable to be here or did he just? He is unable to be here. He, okay. Any questions? Ma'am, did you have something to? Are you an op support? Are you an op support? Your support? I support. Okay, come on up. I'm Mary Hewlett. I live at 5544 Hill Road, which I'm right across the street from the Johnsons. Um, it doesn't bother me. I think it will be very appealing for me to come out of my drive and see that okay. than what I see now, which is the back of somebody else's house. <laughs> I mean, that's, that is, and, it, and it's gonna be, it'll be nice, it'll be pretty, okay. like his house is. So I hope you will pass it okay. for him. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did you have anything else to add? You don't have you don't have to have anything else to add, but no, okay, you had a minute and twenty eight seconds. Just wanted to make sure. No, <laughs> All right, then we'll close the public hearing and ask for.
thoughts? Well, it, um, I mean, the reason we have a side and front setbacks is to have front side and front setbacks, and this is, you know, basically leaving no, it's encroaching very, very much on the setbacks. Mm -hmm. It is a unique, you know, kind of, uh, it's, a, it's a unique shape property. It's a triangle, but, and I'll ask the, the architects, it, it just seems to me like looking at the site plan, what's being built could be moved over and um, you could keep the existing driveway and um, it would, he could, the homeowner could still have what he's looking for, which is a, a structure to put cars. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't see the arch yet, really. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how you, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I think you, you could probably have some wiggle room, but I don't know if it, uh, I don't know if there's enough wiggle room to be substantively different than kind of what it is now. Because I think you have to, you come in that driveway and you, looks like you go left into the garage that I guess is where the house is. And, you know, I mean, it, it, I, I, you think, well, can you pick it up and, and move it somewhere else on the property? I think that's, that's hard. Now, whether or not you need it, I don't know, but the, uh, You know, we have we have one letter uh, from a neighbor that uh, was in opposition, and then we have uh, a neighbor who, who came in support. And the opposing neighbor thought it would uh, kind of change the landscape and green space, um, but I think that's already been changed to some extent with the parking pad, uh, which I think you know you the, the applicant you know could keep and park the car and the boat. Uh, on the pad without the structure and you know it's I guess it's may not be for me to judge would I rather look out my driveway and see a boat and a car that, or a pretty little building that houses the boat and the car uh, I might agree with the neighbor across the street and what I would prefer uh, and I see we don't have any comment from Mr. Swope who would be the council member out there and I don't know if, I, I didn't think to ask if they had even discussed it with him, but there, at least he didn't say he was against it. Any other? Anybody want to make a motion? Well, I, I don't see the hardship, so I'll make a motion to deny the application. Yeah, we have uh, a motion to deny the uh, variance. It has been seconded. Is there any other uh, comment? Then all in favor of the motion, uh, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Four opposed, one. Uh, motion passes four to one. Next case is case 2019-168. Involving property at 811 B 21st Avenue North is the appellant here for this prop for this case Carla Newman Okay, so they are here great you can come forward to the table Before you now is the zoning map showing you the zoning is RM 20 a this is a request for a variance from lot size in order to build three single-family units Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Proposed site plan for this project. And then finally, the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street and across the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 168? I am. Yes, so uh, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make your desired presentation. Please make sure you withhold any time you want for rebuttal and identify yourself by name and address. Mitch Pollard, 2017, Aberdeen Way, Old Hickory, Tennessee. Um, we are requesting a variance for the lot size of RM20A, uh, uh, which would allow us to be able to do three units. Um, as it is, the lot is shy, shy of, uh, we're right around 6,100 square feet, and the codes require 7,500. 
but what we were looking at was the the kind of unique characteristics of the lot and not for I believe at some point where the railroad had actually uh, came through with an easement we actually would have had the, the necessary square footage uh, even so the lot was rezoned back in 2016 to RM20 uh, in the spirit of increasing the density um, and so what well, we're just looking for the variance to be able to do that and by it being the a we we'll, you know we have it designed where the parking is actually gonna we'll have real real low garages on the back so, so how, how, how many square feet is your property because I thought I had written down you said how many square feet is your property 60 runs roughly 6100 okay Seventy five hundred is required for that's the minimum. Yes, sir. Minimum. Okay. And so, yeah, and, and, and I guess so just so I'm clear with the um, with the codes are, you know, the the square footage that you have would allow three units, but it's the minimum lot size for RM20 to have three units is that's what's holding you up. You got it right. Phrased another way, density is not at issue here, just the hard line of 7,500 on the lot area. And then the appellant's comments with regard to the easement that took a portion of the property that would otherwise exist. If I could ask the secretary to go back to the uh, zoning map from her first slide. The, well, I guess it doesn't show it as well. If you zoom that map out some more, it would actually show that a number of the nearby lots are deeper, as shown here, to the immediate south along 21st, thus giving you some sense of absent the rail, you have a depth such that you would be at 7,500, it appears. But because the zoning code specifically says that RM20A requires that minimum of 7,500, that's why the appellant is here with a lot size variance rather than any sort of variance regarding density, which is not even appealable as it so happens. Right. So when you say it's not about density, it's not about how many units he can build. It's just about whether he can build, period. Okay, all right. So I got you. I mean, even if he was proposing uh, one uh, house with minimal square footage, he still can't do it under the code. Is that what? Okay. He, he couldn't build anything. That's correct, because under the, the under the so. table, it's specific to that zoning district, RM20A, that it's a non-starter unless you've got the 7,500. Okay. Well, and, and he said 6,100, but it says right here he's providing 6,800, and that's 700 square feet difference. 6,800 makes him 700 square feet short, as opposed to... 1,400 square feet short, is that right? I'm going to lend to the math major uh, <laughs> on the board. Hey, I told you I'd, I'd long forgotten all that. Well, that, that, was, that was one of the reasons I asked for the clarity, and I, I should have said, because I, I remember seeing the 6,800 in the, um, from, from, I don't know if it was the codes. No. It may have been, yeah. I think you, I think you're correct. So in, calcu <clears throat> in calculating the, is it, <clears throat> excuse me, is it a railroad easement that's coming through the back of the property? Yes. And that can't be counted as part of the square footage, is that correct? No. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant at this time? All right, if, uh, you will have eight minutes and 52 seconds for rebuttal and we will hear from the opposition. My name is Miss, oh, excuse me. My name is Miss Beatrice Nichols. I live on 817 21st Avenue North. And my objection is that my house on one side and my garden I have on 813, that big lot. And I, if they're gonna build three story, it gonna block my garden spot, the sun and everything. Uh, that's why I'm objecting to this. Okay. Um, because I live on 817, but I got a property also on 813 next to my house. Is that, is that right next door to this property? The way that he's talking about want to build is because uh, my house, I got a lot, 813. And okay. there's a fence already around it. 
and also you see my, that on, in, in this picture is that the one that's just north of that red dot or just yes on, is above the mine just above the, yeah. the red dot yes okay and now his the site plan he he proposes I, it, I don't see that it shows how many stories I don't see that but it does have um, well, it looks like 20, 19 feet uh, between his building and your property. Does that still give you concern about the? Well, uh, what he was talking about, that it's going to be really close to the fence, really, really close. If you're talking about building, because. Well, the, the site plan that, that, that's shown, uh, and I don't know if we can go to that. Uh, Maybe I'm, I'm looking at this the wrong way, but I was... Is he building close to you or away from you on that picture? It looks like it could be really, really close to the fence. So you're, you're, on this picture, you're saying your property's below? Yes. Yeah, well, all right, I think I think that may be some confusion because I think the applicant's saying it's your property is so, uh, is um, is above what's it, that one and that's well, let's see. Well, my property, okay, eight thirteen. He's want to build on above that eight eleven. Right. Well, I guess I guess if the way I look at this, um, when I when I looked at the overview. The property below had a lot of trees. The property above looked like it would have Yeah, to well, it got a whole lot of trees in the back, and also between the fences, there is a whole lot of trees that need to be cut down, true enough. But the talk more behind my house, the railroad, right. there's a whole lot of trees behind there. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm just trying to, I just, the way, I, I'm, I'm reading this differently, and I just want to make sure that, that we're, we got the right spot. I mean, I, the way I read this, your property is above, you know, this drawing, and so you're going to have the most space between your building. You'll have 20 feet, almost 19 feet, between where his building starts and your lot. Okay. It's what it's the way I read it, and we can ask the applicant maybe or let our architect help us. Can I ask your name one more time, Miss Nichols, Beatrice Nichols. Nichols? Okay, so on this um, this plan that we see here, I'm reading, I'm zooming into it, and it. At the very top, it says Beatrice Nichols, William Nichols, Joseph Nichols. Yes. So your property is actually to the north of what he's uh, developing. Okay. Yeah. So, so your your lot on this drawing is above. So, I, and I'm not saying it's it's okay or not okay. I'm just trying to clear, make sure we're all clear on just what he's building and how it relates to you. Um, you're here to tell me if it's okay or not okay I'm with not. you, and it, but you will have. Um, there's five feet between his building and the lot on the other side, but there's 19 feet between his building and your and your lot. Um, and the way I think you read the plans and I read the plans, and that, and that may still be you may still have the exact same concern. But I I just will always like to make sure I know exactly where everybody is and what's going on. I can't figure this out because I don't have anything. I mean, I have sheets, but. I guess I'm, if she's worried about no sun on her garden, we'd better be talking about what is west and east. The sun that she yes. needs comes from the east or the west. And so I would like to know if the building is going north of her or south of her, east, west, what direction? Because I'm not sure what this drawing, where is north on this drawing? I don't know. The development is due south of the opponent. That helps. Thank you. I just didn't want to assume that. I'm not, I'm not a <laughs> so you can tell me how I that am. affects the garden. <laughs> I am. I grew up on the farm. I know All about right. gardens. So but you, we just want to make sure that your your concerns are registered and that that's part of the discussion. So is, were, those, were those the only concerns that you had about this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because I have a garden every year since I've been living there, over 50 years. And, you know, 
And when you get block the sun from it, nothing well, can uh, well, grow. We'll ask the gardeners. And on I already the, on got the, my garden in already. All right. <laughs> we'll ask the gardeners on the board, but it, it, it sounds like if you're due south, then it, it may it may not have the impact that, that, that you're worried about, but we will definitely talk about that and, and, and consider that for sure. I hope so. All right. Did you have anything else to tell us? No, that's it. Okay. I just, I just love my garden and I just hope it is. I just want to know if I can have some green beans when they yeah. come in. I got green beans, I got corn, I got squash, I got okra, I got tomatoes, I got radish. I got a little bit of everything in there. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for Thanks. being here. All right, thank you. Y'all have a blessed one. Thanks, you too. All right, we'll hear from the applicant again with eight minutes and 52 seconds for rebuttal. Just, just real quick, I, I, myself and Ms. Nichols talk. I, I'm gonna, I was trying to figure out something, you know, um, if, if even if we could place the garden somewhere, we, we were trying to figure out something. So I'm not, because Ms. Sanford, I'm, I'm with you. I want to know what she's growing. So at some point, I'm going to want some myself. But uh, I, I, I don't, if there's anything I can figure out to work with her as we go through the process, I, I'll do anything I can. I just don't know. And if, you're, uh, if you are due south, does that, does that impact the sun? It will be much better if it's south, because if it was west of her property, you know, it would just cut it off, and she wouldn't have a garden. I, I don't have anything else. Okay. Did you? All right. Well, we've closed the public hearing and and discussed thoughts. Well, I see the hardship in the um, with the easement, um, so I understand that hardship. Um, so I think it's a valid request. Yeah, the um, you know, I, um, and I'm glad we cleared up the 68 versus the 61. I, you know, 10 percent plus or minus is is kind of my rule of thumb on these. This is slightly over, but I do think because of the railroad easement and the size of the lots next door, um, and Andy's not asking for any other variances. Uh, this is the kind of situation, uh, you know, we have had, uh, we have had several lot size variance requests that were perfectly uh, rectangular, where they were just created that way, and, uh, and when they vary much more than uh, four or five percent, I then I think that that's uh, not appropriate, but this is definitely not uh, a rectangle, and I, I agree. Did you have a motion? Um, sure, I will move to approve the variance request uh, based on the um, irregular shape of the lot in the easement. I second. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. Is there any discussion? And, and note that it definitely took into account the consideration of, of uh, the expectation of not impacting the garden. All right, all in favor say aye. Any opposed? That motion passes five to zero. Thank you and good luck. The last case for the board to consider today is case 2019-152. This is a short-term rental appeal challenging the denial of a permit for operating on an expired permit. Mr. Osborne is not here today, but I've got the facts. Um, he gave me the sheet, his cheat sheet with the facts, so I'll happily relay those to the board. Um, the permit was originally obtained on December 22nd, 2016. It expired on December 22nd, 2017 and was not renewed. Thereafter, there were 39 rentals in that year period without the permit. Um, notice was sent to the applicant on January 11th, notifying her that a um, short-term rental violation existed. On January 28th she, of 2017, rather, she had um, emailed Mr. Osborne regarding this notice. So um, thereafter, it looks like the advertisement was removed but then put back up. Um, a new review was left on between February 21st and March 1st, indicating that Reynolds had continued um, between her application to the BZA and her appearance today. And was that, when, when, what year was that? 
The permit expired in December of 2017. Um, I guess she was sent notice on January 2019. That's when HUD's compliance picked up the violation. We in sent 19. her notice. Okay. So basically, a year and some change after it expired, we notified her that it had been expired for a year, um, and it. I believe she, there was some indication um, per host compliance that she had operated between her appeal and her appearance here today. Great. Hello. Is Hi. there anyone here in opposition to this? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Ms. Bueller, you'll have 10 minutes to make your desired presentation. Make sure you identify yourself by name and address and also reserve some rebuttal time if you'd like to respond to the opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Julie Bueller. Uh, I live at 105 McGavick Pike. Um, she just said that I was notified and that I closed down and reopened, and that is definitely not true. I never reopened that house. As soon as I heard that I did not have a permit, I closed it down. The, uh, they said there might have been a review. What would, why, why would a review? Yes. I contacted um, Airbnb and told them what was going on with codes, and I needed to shut everything down. I was fully booked for March. Um, I explained it to them, and they seemed to have under, understood, but they would not take me down. And I went back on there over and over again, begging to take me down. Um, they were responding, and then they weren't responding. Um, I was sitting on a Thursday night, and um, these people contact me that they're coming to my house the next day, and I was not supposed to be up. I told them they could not come to my house. I did not let them come. And so if you look at that review, it says we did not stay at that house. So I cannot give a review. Um, I called Airbnb and told them that now there's a bad review on there and that they did not stay at the house. And so they removed that review. All right. Um, and you, uh, the, your council member came in and asked us to support you and said that uh, we thought it was just an honest mistake that you, I mean, and you're not the first to come here and say, I, I didn't get a letter and I forgot to renew my permit. Yes. But is that what you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Forgot to renew your permit. I did. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Any, any questions for the applicant? Is there anything you had like to add now? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. We have you all eight, eight minutes and twenty four seconds to uh, when you come back after we hear from the opposition. Okay. Thank you. All right, if you state your name and tell us why you're opposed to this. Hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is Betsy Morgan, and I'm the property owner next to 107 McGavick Pike. Um, the owners of the property do not currently live, live in the house. Um, and my understanding is for short-term rentals, you need to either, you, you need to be an owner. You can either occupy that residence and rent it out as a short-term rental, or you can not live in that, um, you can be a non-occupied owner. And um, we don't believe that the house in the short-term rental is being operated under the Metro codes. And um, uh, above and beyond that, we're zoned residential. And um, my understanding from the Metro codes is that as a non-owner occupied, you do have to be the owner on the deed, but also it's, it, for the new non-owner occupied, you do have to, uh, you, or rather they cannot um, be licensed in a residential area. Um, because no one is currently residing in the home, um, that uh, gives us a little bit of concern. We've recently contacted an architect to build on the property. We've owned the property for over 10 years. And um, we had uh, contacted with an, uh, an architect prior to receiving the letter from Metro. And we would not have contacted an architect to build a single residence home if we had known that the short-term rental would be in effect. Um, as a business owner, I would assume that um, you would be very on top of renewing your permits and your licenses and things like that. And it sounds to me like that that was not done at a, in a proper amount of time. Um, 
one thing that we're concerned with also is that the current owner of the home told us at one point in time that when they renovated the home that the, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not in construction at all, so I don't know, but that the home itself that at 107 McGavick Pike uh, was overbuilt for the property lines. I don't know if those are the setback issues that you all been talking about this th all day long. Um, but we're concerned that when we build a home there, will this home be a short-term rental with a revolving door of unknown people in a residence? Um, you know, we're just so concerned you, about that. You said that you don't believe, it, you, you, You've talked about a lot of owners and 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 whatnot, and we can ask the applicant, uh, you know, who owns the house. I mean, but you, what what leads you to believe that the house is not owner occupied? Um, we've we've met the owner multiple times. I mean, who do you who do you think is the owner? Um, Richard and Ellen Davis. Okay. And they are on the deed. Okay. Okay, and that's who, that's who the name of the permit is in? We don't know that, but again, what the board's considering is whether or not the permittee can come in and, and right, reapply, right, right. Um, in which case the, our staff would review all that and make sure they meet whatever legal requirements are in place. Right, and that, that's a good, the reason, and part of the reason to ask is that um, on, an, on an expired permit, Usually, uh, if, if a permit expires, it's, it's like you forgot to renew your car tag, right? You've done everything right. You've gotten, you've been inspected by the fire marshal. You've gotten, you know, you've, you've passed through the hoops. And what we're here to do today is not to give them another permit, or any, but we're just to say, you let, your, you let your permit expire. You can go apply for another permit. And so I don't want to go too far down this road, other than the fact that you've sat here for four and a half hours and, and should have another couple minutes to say your piece, um, and that uh, that is because when they do reply, if there is evidence that they don't live there, then that's something that would come out then. They, they would have to come and testify that, no, we, I own the home, I live in the home, here's the proof that the law requires for me to, to do that, and if there's something on record that that might uh, give them pause to say, well, let me explore it a little bit more closely, then I think it's important for you to, to share that. So that, that's why I asked that question. Is, or, were there other things that, that make you think that this isn't uh, operating legitimately that you haven't told us? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, other than the fact that um, I understood from what the young lady over there was saying that there were some rentals after the permit expired, or maybe I misunderstood that. Yeah, no, I um, think that the, the applicant has testified that, uh, the applicant testified to that fact and said that, that, that it was, there was a review, but it was a bad review because she, they didn't allow that person to stay there okay. while they were having trouble with, uh, with the uh, Airbnb site to take everything down. And so, I mean, again, that was testimony that, that we just mm -hmm. heard, so that, mm -hmm. I, 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 don't, I haven't seen the reviews. I don't know, but, but okay. there was there was a, a comment about a review. Yes. There was an explanation, and that's all we know. Yes, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought she said there were like 37 or 39 rentals. No, I think well, I think that period. was from the time it expired until the time that they were uh, notified. And again, if you, you know. I'm sure you're not bored enough to watch us on Channel 3, but if you watched us uh, very often, <laughs> you'll know that this is by far not the first expired permit we've had. And and it's not unusual for it to go that long yes. because people just, yes. and the city doesn't, uh, and these doesn't give a renewal. Yes. Uh, yes. So it's it's not, uh, it, it's, a, it's an easy mistake to understand. Yes, I understand. But, uh, but, but what the testimony was, was that from January, when she got the letter, yes. uh, she testified that, stopped immediately, yep. there was evidence that there was one review, and she, that's where she said, no, after I told to, told to stop, I did stop, and I had to tell somebody no, and they wrote yes. a bad review. So that, that's, I hope that clears that up. Uh, again, not defending or anything, just trying to make sure everybody's on the same page <laughs> with, with, uh, with the facts. Did you, did you have something to say? I, yeah. Should you press the button and tell us who you are and 
your address and what you have to say. Um, my name is Sarah Anatrella, and I live at 109C McGavick Pike. Um, if you're looking at that picture, it's the very bottom empty lot on that picture. We just built a house and just moved in about three weeks ago. Um, and then we got the letter about the short-term rental. We have really small children, and it just, my biggest concern is the revolving door of people and the fact that from talking to our neighbor on the opposite side of us that's not in the picture is a kind of what she had mentioned. Um, the house is empty. It's not occupied when there's not a, a rental that she doesn't live there. And so it's an empty house and then it is never the same person that's there and it just makes me nervous with small children being so close and then having an empty lot between the two of us, which does provide a buffer, but it's just kind of, there's not a lot of monitoring between our house and that house. Okay. So that's all. Okay. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. And then we will hear from the applicant. So help us uh, help us understand uh, who owns the house and how you relate to the ownership. Okay. I'd be happy to. Um, I live at 105, which is right next door to that house. Um, the Uffelmans lived there for a long time. I was neighbors with them for 20 years, and they came to me and offered for me to purchase their home, and they said that they would hold the note for me. Um, I have paperwork that I brought to show that. Um, so I'm not on the deed, but I do own the home legally, and I can show you that. I just make my payments to him. Um, I do live at 105, and they're worried about the house of 107 not being occupied, but it is occupied 100% of the year by my daughter. Um, I have pictures on my phone of mail that gets sent to her. So 100% of the time, somebody is living on the property and I also live next door. I've lived there for 20 years. It is fully occupied. Um, yep. I, okay, well, um, okay, thank you. Um, and. I'm sorry, did you have something, did you have anything um, else to add? Also, the lots are really big, and there is a lot of space between my properties and them, and I also have the signatures. These are the people that maybe would be affected by the property, like if you saw, like, lots of cars or crazy things or something going on, but I'm really, really selective on who I rent to. I ask them questions about who is staying at the house. Why are you, why are you coming to stay at the house? I make sure they don't live in Nashville. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna have a party or crazy people. I might, I'm just not gonna do it. This is. These are like family homes to me. My daughter is right there. I'm right there. We do would not rent to anybody that seemed sketchy or not good for the neighborhood or my family. Um, I got the four people across the street from me to sign this, saying that they're fine with me having an Airbnb. We all have really big lots. I would never want anything unsafe in my neighborhood either. I've been a part of the neighborhood for a long time. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? I guess I want to get clear on who you have bought the house from. You first yes. said the Davises, and then you said the Offelmans had lived there. Well, his name is um, Dick Davis, and he's married to Ellen. And Miss Betty Offelman was the mother of Ellen, and Ellen, Betty lived on the property forever, and I was her neighbor. I actually owned the 109 McGavick Pike where, on the other side of the lot, and I know that those people were trying to contact and purchase my property from me at 107, and that may be also why they don't want me to operate. Are there other questions? I've also had no complaints. All right. 
Did you, and do you have anything else to add? If you want to see pictures of the property at Broadham, if you want to see the contract between um, Mr. Dick Davis and um, Ellen Uffelman, I brought that along. Yeah, I, I don't know that we need, I mean, it, the, the issue is an expired permit, and so that, that I, I think that we have the information that we need unless someone else would like to, to see that. It, it, if there's nothing else to add, then I will close the public hearing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, we'll close the public hearing. Um, there were a lot of issues that were raised in terms of ownership, and, and frankly, I think that has impact on eligibility. Um, but as our zoning administrator wisely uh, said, if, if you heard it because it was quick, that's not uh, what we're here uh, to talk about. Um, it's, it uh, is strictly whether or not the applicant can apply for a permit after having operated on an expired permit. And in those situations, um, you know, we typically allow them to apply very quickly. Um, now that said, I know the opposition has raised a lot of questions and I just want uh, to make sure that uh, it's clear that they know that the issues that were raised will be uh, discussed and evaluated in the application process, that those are not issues that, that we are here to, to talk about. And so uh, I'll move that the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit on Monday and uh, make sure that the applicant knows that, uh, that uh, you're not to rent until you have a permit and that you have to go through the whole application process um, and, and meet the criteria of an owner-occupied Airbnb if that is indeed what you're applying for. Uh, so that's my motion. Sorry, I didn't hear when. Uh, Monday. Monday. Just it, because it's an expired permit and, okay. uh, and the, the one rental after they were notified was explained uh, as a negative review that, um, so that, didn't, that wasn't an actual rental. According to the testimony. Okay, I'll second. Second. Any more discussion? Okay, all say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Four and opposed. That passes four to one. All right. We're done. That concludes the April 18th meeting of the BZA. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.